Good morning, everyone. Hi, morning. So maybe we can start our third day of <clears throat> conference. So um, I'm just going to say a few words just for our last day, and then we can start with our first speaker. So finally, we have arrived at our third and final day of conference. Today's topic will be clothing identities in museums, how we can rethink and remake dress exhibitions in museums in a more inclusive way, and discuss their colonial, ethnic, nationalistic, and religious markers and symbolism how we can prompt interaction between textile collections in museums and to the public. These were the questions and challenges we have proposed to our speakers of the day. Our presenters have, in an amazing way, answered all our call and will bring to the table a wide variety of subjects, ranging from dress recreations, jewelry, museum collections, and many, many more. We are absolutely confident these presentations will be very successful and that all including our viewers on YouTube will enjoy them. Finally, I just want to remind the speakers to stick to the 20 minute scheduled time. This is the last day, so we really do not want to get behind on schedule. After each speaker will have time for questions, including those asked through YouTube. And so without further ado, I let me just open the biographies. I will present our first uh, speaker of the day, Karina Kroma. I do apologize if I don't pronounce every name <laughs> correctly. <laughs> so Karina is a director of the Department of Prehistory, Natural History Museum in Vienna. She studied prehistory, archeology, span ethnology, and anthropology at the University of Vienna in Austria. Uh, she did her habilitation thesis in 2019, uh, entitled Archaeological Textile Research, Technical, Economic, and Social Aspects of Textile Production and Clothing from Neolithic to Early Modern Era. She is specialized on interdisciplinary and integrated analysis of textiles, research on textile tools, and reconstruction of prehistory costumes. Her research covers a time span from to 2500 BCE until 1000 CE and geographical area from Central Europe to Iran. Karina, the floor is yours. You must unmute yourself, Karina. Okay. Start with this. Oops. And okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Here in this session, we have the following aims. How can we rethink and remake dress in exhibitions in museum in a more inclusive way? Um, and uh, we also, uh, also want to talk a bit about dissemination and strategies on the interaction between museums and the public. And here I want to present some general ideas uh, that we have at the Natural History Museum in Vienna, how we handle the disseminations of our projects. To set this into a context, the Natural History Museum in Vienna was built in the 19th century and it houses uh, the natural history collections of the Habsburg family. One of the unique selling points of the museum is the historical ensemble of the building, which was made to be a museum, it's not an adapted palace. And we have extensive uh, collections uh, covering biology, earth sciences, anthropology, and archaeology with more than 30 million objects. And the main goals of the museum are the preservation and expansion of this collection, but also the research and dissemination. And there are a lot of different decisions we are making when we are doing exhibitions. For example, we want to highlight 
objects and their stories, for example, our Venus of Willendorf. Uh, we also want to have some narratives on specific sites like Hallstatt or the Celtic uh, Sanctuary Roseldorf. We also have to give a general outline of prehistory about cultural developments and also technological inventions. But what we also want to do is to tell stories of contemporary significance like migration, identity, resource management, and uh, recycling. Um, at the Department of Prehistory, one of the uh, research focus is the textile archaeology. And this we do with the aim to study the technical, economic, social implications of textile production and clothing for societies from Stone Age to early modern times. And of course, garments play an important role for the visual coding in prehistoric and historic societies and also for the communication of identity. And for this, we also had a uh, Euroweb workshop last week, which was great fun. There is something important that we have to think about. It's the challenges of our time. And we have to ask the, put, uh, the question, uh, is there a potential to resonate our uh, research to outside academia? For example, how to tell people how archaeology and especially textile research is relevant to their daily life and uh, can we have some um, contributions to current debates. In my eyes, for textile archaeology, there is a link to the global challenges in um, the access to cultural heritage, the perpetuation of techniques and skills belonging to intangible heritage the use of resources and how to use them, people's identity, mobility, migration, and uh, the identity topic is uh, the topic of this conference also. And But there is really the question is how to disseminate that and how to get people involved. Uh, now I want to dive into the topic about what is identity status, but also performance now and in deep history. And I want to start now. Clothing and costume, the ensemble of garments, dress accessoires, jewelry, shoes, head covers, are distinctive factors of nonverbal communications in prehistory and beyond. I mean, all the conference was about this topic. Um, but modern, I just, because this is our, our um, uh, yeah, connection to modern societies, how it is seen today. In Western world, for example, we also uh, demonstrate our identities with garments, especially some professions like those who see here, firefighters, policemen, doctors. And what garments are doing in modern society, if people are not really aware about that, they give us a hint, for example, to trust those people, to trust that they are who they seem to be, that they know what to do, and that they are allowed to, to do that, what they are doing. And also people themselves uh, dress themselves to various um, identities in private occasions. Uh, for example, um, in, in this case, uh, it, it's, it's um, belongingness. If for, you are, for example, a member of an Austrian brass band, as Trachtenmusikkapelle, or if you are a sports fan, and even in the very personal identity, you show that via your garments. For example, here, my personal identity is as a business lady, of course, then housewife and mother, that's also what I am my identity as a proud Austrian visit and on some occasions I also have historical garments. That means that uh, in the uh, general discourse today, when you talk to people about dress and identity, then they always say, no, that doesn't matter today because everyone can wear everything. But it's not as easy like that. And what's about people thousands of years ago? What did they think is clothing about. Okay, of course, it, uh, um, back in time, it served as protection against climate, rain, cold, heat, but it also influences the body, the texture, the silhouette, and the garments have a very big uh, uh, importance for the body language, for the options of movement. And it's the question if ancient people have been aware of that or not. 
That means when we are talking about prehistoric or historic garments, we have to talk about a lot of different things, such as the self-perception, external perception, individual and social identity, gender, silhouette, um, cultural identity, body language, and many more. And for that, I just want to discuss this a bit with our reconstructions. Uh, we have a lot of them and we use them in uh, very much uh, different um, um, things. Um, but the problem that we have here in Central Europe is that we don't have complete garments like known from other uh, areas, um, yeah, for example, from Scandinavia. And so we just have to, to take what we get, uh, for example, here, the fibrillae from the Hashat uh, Cemetery, uh, along with the dress, uh, with the placement patterns in the graves, and then combined with the dress from Huldremuse in Denmark. Or this is our Hashtag period man with the checkered plate, shoes, fur cap, and those are replicas of finds from the Hallstatt salt mine and Riesafane leggings. But back to identity, status, and performance. What can we learn from our um, uh, evidence, for example, from prehistoric and early um, medieval uh, Central Europe? Here, for example, of course, we can learn about gender and social components, social identity. Uh, for example, here in the Iron Age, the Situla art shows a lot of dressed persons and we recognize sometimes also social identity. For example, the upper class, they have long garments with sleeves and the hat, but we also have serving persons like here on the Situla from Kufan and from Vace, and they have different kinds of garments, shorter sleeves and sometimes no garment on the upper body. I'm completely aware that, for example, in the ancient uh, Greece and uh, Rome, there is much more pictorial evidence. But for Central Europe in prehistory, we are somehow a bit poor about that. Yeah, but gender design can also be seen. Of course, here, Hallstatt period, again, uh, we know different garments for men and women, different silhouettes, skirts, long dresses for women and especially veils, but for men, the most obvious are the different headgears and the trousers. For early medieval in Central Europe, we know that women have knee long or longer dress and also veils. And in the archeological record, we see nice jewelry, brooches, and everything is quite distinctive here with the placement patterns. The general design is also obvious in the written and pictorial sources of the time, for example, here, and also in, uh, in the grave goods that we have. But more about that will be um, presented later by the talk of um, Anna Zimmermann and Kelly Sanderson. The cultural identity is very easy if we have a lot of different sources, especially written sources. Um, for example, for the Romans, we know a lot. And for the Roman period, this is very well studied because the Romans called themselves the Gens Togata, the people with, with toga. And it's a strong identity creating garment. And it was so important for the Romans that even in the Roman provinces, for example, in the area where is Nordis, Austria, um, people who had the Roman citizenship uh, wore the Roman toga and also depicted themselves on tombstones, for example, here in the provinces Noricum and Pannonia. But the interesting thing is that women of the same period are never depicted as women in central Rome, but always in local dress. For example, here the tombstone of Klagenfurt, and we also find the same phenomenon in the graves where we have exactly those items in the graves. What can we say with other messages? For example, the self-perception or the external perception. What's about sound, for example? Uh, usually nobody thinks or we start to think now about sound in prehistoric garments. And I want to call it the high heel, heel effect. For example, if a modern woman comes along in high heels, everyone hears that. And she gets more attention than if someone walks around with sneakers. And maybe the sound effect of garments and whatever whatever you uh, wear is a sign of for attractivity for prestige for status and so on 
And in prehistory, we also have things like that. And that are the large Hallstatt period Tintinabuli. I mean, you can really not overlook this person. And I think the long pendants have a sound effect like today's high heels. And what does it tell us? It tells us, look at me, I'm good looking, I'm rich. It's it's really a, a, a statement for a high status via sound. But there are also other components like feel and touch and this message, for example, of this uh, I, um, Bronze Age spike pendants, it's quite distinctive. What does it say to us? Stay away, don't touch me. And important here is that the graves where those items are in are usually uh, on um, females of the really upper class. That means, and older ones like me, I mean, my age is old in Bronze Age. Um, it's it's really a, a physical distance holder that is materialized uh, itself in this really very dangerous looking jewelry status symbol. Yes, and also body language, silhouettes, all of that is are things that we can talk about. Gendered silhouettes, for example, in early, med uh, early medieval, on the one hand, you see the feet of the um, of the males, it's a complete different silhouette, especially also if you look from behind. Um, the, the women have the veil, you then don't see uh, the head as a head from behind. And also, usually they have longer dresses. And also the posture, body language, movement. There is sometimes a specific enhancement in the posture, a specific body language. For example, the Roman toga, um, it, it's a drapery with a big volume of fabric, five meters long. And you can only wear this and perform with it with dignity and grandezza, so to say. Otherwise, he would lose his garments. In contrast to the Celtic warrior, he's very sporty. He can ride, he can climb on a tree, whatever. And this is not possible for the toga man. And um, our Bronze Age women from Franzhausen, for example, uh, the massive headgear influences not only the silhouette of the garment, but also the posture and the gesture. She has to keep uh, strictly upright, uh, otherwise the headgear would just fall off. And she also represents with this a high status with her garment and something that you would not usually expect from um, Europe 4,000 years ago. And this representative um, idea of a garment can be compared with this Rococo lady here. She also performs with dignity and grace because her body is pressed in crinoline and corset and so on. Yes. And usually uh, for archaeology, one what you usually don't think about is, is how does the things look in daylight, but also at night? And what kind of lightning is possible? And what you see, what, what you don't see, how things are reflecting and uh, also in combination with body movement and others. That means we have here a full range of how to perform, how to do the staging of uh, identities of um, um, yeah, of uh, everything what you want to express. But now to the dissemination in our museum. Um, when we have to decide at the museum for certain storytelling, uh, then we also use reconstructions and recreations of garments because uh, they are quite useful to, to send messages. And for dissemination, we have a lot of different kinds, what we do, for example, guided tours, workshops, events, and so on. And historical clothing plays a role um, to make um, our research visible and accessible to the wider public and also to kids, for example. Uh, textile uh, objects are also included in our um, uh, displays, but also always again and again reconstructed items like here, this one, I've shown it before. But it's not uh, only the physical reconstruction we are doing, but also a virtual uh, reconstruction, for example, for our technique lover, uh, lovers, um, and a virtual changing room, you can uh, select different outfits and then you can morph your face in, for example, this is an early medieval avar man. 
And since the last autumn, we also have a new room for science communication. Some of you already know this. It's Deck 50. And here we have uh, large installations, for example, this tablet weaving uh, loom. But we also have these researchers' boxes for kids where you can do some small excavation. And for also those graves and the content of this grave have then been recreated as a garment that at least can even be tried on by the people. According to media, we also do a lot of films, BBC documentaries, and things like that, of course. But usually, um, the presentation of reconstructed uh, prehistoric garments is very static, looking more like reenactors in open air with museums. And here we go new ways. For example, we work with graphic designers and pop up artists. And so we want to create a very modern visual language, like you see here. Uh, to transfer the thousands of years old garments into our modern world and into our modern uh, needs. For example, this is the art project Refractions from the Past by Peter Sena. This is also usually not a movement or things that we would usually do with uh, reconstructed garments, but it really functions quite well. And to present our things to a wider public, usually archaeologists do that in if they make posters, for example, for a science day or whatever. And usually they do it like a conference poster. But for a lot of people, this is a barrier because they don't want to look at it. They, they see a lot of things to read and then they go by and say, no, no, I don't want to do this. But uh, here we also try a different approach. For example, we are creating fashion mood boards. And such, we use a visual language that modern people are familiar with, uh, with, and so we try to set some anchor points in emotions, in moods, in colors, and to take to, to take the people with us, at, um, to create engagement with the people, and also uh, we try to fill in a lot of information uh, that we can work with. But it's not like you have to learn this and we want to teach you. That means uh, to be it in a more um, playful uh, thing. And here's one about children's clothing. We have a lot of them. And also communicating with dress sometimes gets quite nice things. <laughs> Here's something funny for you, even old artifacts in new cloth. In this, uh, <laughs> in this case, the Venus of Willendorf was used as a testimonial for body positivity and diversity in modern fashion industry, aging in style. Yes. So. Yeah, but back to the uh, dress body as a communication medium. Uh, as you have seen in the last minutes, that there is a lot of a, a potential in expressing identity and comparing things and getting uh, people involved, even with example from deep history. And so for the global challenges in the debates on identity and uh, yeah, uh, um, tolerance and integration. Uh, we use, for example, uh, reconstructed garments um, in fashion shows. And for that, we uh, usually produce a very wide media coverage. And we are also talk, uh, able to talk in this on our interdisciplinary research about cultural heritage, global challenges to a very wide topic. And now I come to my last slide here because we want to bridge here the contemporary discourse about dress and identity, which is sometimes very emotional. For example, as responsible uh, archaeologists, we also have to um, the duty to talk about very difficult topics. For example, in Austria, it's a very um, yeah big discussion about uh, how to wear a veil for women, uh, a hijab, uh, for example, it's, it's um, for school kids, and it's a very political discussion, and sometimes it gets it's really nasty uh, as uh, kids are nagging on, on, on each other, uh, for example, on, on uh, girls with veils. And here we, I have an activity as a young science ambassador. It's uh, by the Austrian Ministry of Education. And I'm visiting schools with a very uh, deliberately designed program. And also uh, Kaylee sometimes uh, is assisting me on that. And uh, we go into schools and we want to stimulate discussions about the role of dress in identity building. And there we tell the story about the Roman uh, habit of re referring to themselves as togati, that is 
the people wearing the toga with a positive connotation and calling the people uh, living north of the Alps as Prakati, that is the Garmani, which is a negative connotation, uh, wearing the trousers. And so we can use a 2,000-year-old example about perspectives on garments as identity holder, and we can integrate that to the experience of pupils who, for example, came to Austria as migrants or refugees from the Middle East to gain some acceptance and understanding for different dress codes and some tolerance. So, uh, yes, and after this very serious topic, at the end of my paper, I have the pleasure to hand over to the next paper, uh, because for the interactive exhibition at our museums, uh, we have a new science communication room, and there we, it was necessary to recreate the clothing of an early 6th century Lombard dress um, of the princess of Hauskirchen, Mann and Kaylee Saunderson. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, would you like, this is a proposal maybe for Kaylee and Anna to present now, and then the questions can follow both your presentations, maybe it makes sense? Yeah, because uh, the papers are They're connected. Together. I mean, okay. I did the museum part, they are doing the reconstruction part, but we are connected to each other. Okay, so maybe that would make sense if it's okay for everyone. I'm just yes. gonna introduce um, Kaylee. Kaylee Sanderson is a master's student of prehistory and historical archaeology at the University of Vienna. She conducts research at the Natural History Museum, working on projects such as golden threads from the late Bronze Age in Austria and Hungary. Her foci lie on the analysis and reconstructions of textiles and the public communication of these spanning from the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and the early medieval period from Central and Western Europe, as well as the Near East. She will present this paper together with Anna Zimmerman, She's, which is studying uh, prehistory and uh, historical archaeology at the University of Vienna. Her main interest is in textiles and organic working materials. She creates research-based graphical reconstructions for archaeological projects, exhibitions, and public outreach. She does research and reconstructions with the Department of Prehistory at the Museum of Natural History, and for her research on pleated textiles of the Lombard area, she received the Karl von Scherbers Award for Young Researchers. I'm sorry, I hope I said that right. <laughs> You're free to go. So uh, we'll be presenting uh, the costume of Hauskirchen. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So as Karina has just presented, there are a few costumes from prehistory and early history at the interactive Deck 50. And one of these was recreated by Anna and me, the so-called Princess of Hauskirchen, based on the burial of a young woman from the early medieval Lombard period in Lower Austria, from the sixth century CE. The reason for her being termed a princess are the two draft horses buried alongside her, which have very lavish golden harnesses, as you can see here on the right. The burial goods on the woman though were all robbed contemporarily. Yeah, and this burial is part of the science lab station that Karina just showed, where the visitors can physically excavate a burial uh, in a miniature version, where the photo of the costume is then presented. Recreating this costume in particular, in particular uh, proved to be quite challenging. On the one hand, due to the few sources for this period, and on the other hand, due to us having to present a woman of high status using only the objects found in the specific burial. So for this exhibition, uh, we could use only objects that were uh, actually in the burial and nothing that was not in the burial. And the problem was, as I just stated, that the woman did not have a single piece of metal on her. And usually we would expect fibula of precious metal, for example. This meant that her high status had to be shown using only ephemeral materials and in this case, textiles. On the bright side, there are two textile techniques known from this period and region, 
that were well suited for this recreation. Yeah, but before uh, we dive deeper into this, um, let me just show you where and when we are. Uh, when we talk about the Lombard period in Austria, we refer actually to just a few decades uh, between 489 and 568. Um, here you will see um, a map uh, of Austria with the modern borders, just so um, you have a bit of orientation. Uh, Vienna is here. Can you all see my pointer? Yes. Okay. Um, then uh, up here is Hauskirchen. Uh, and down here uh, at the Danube is a Maria Ponce, um, a burial ground that will become uh, more important in a minute. Uh, it's the biggest um, burial ground that we have of the Lombard period in Austria. Um, when these people that call themselves Lombards um, left uh, to Italy, um, they also left the burial grounds and they were nearly all robbed within the next months or years. So that's uh, a little tricky <laughs> because we don't have um, a lot of uh, good, reliable sources. Um, good thing is that uh, they started to write down the history and laws uh, when they arrived in Italy. Uh, the most important uh, written sources are the Leges Langobardorum and Historia Langobardorum. Uh, there is not much written there about women and especially not women's clothing, but when you read very carefully, uh, there are some paragraphs that um, suggest, for example, that women wore multi-layered clothing and that uh, veils may have been an indication for mar martial st status or for nuns. Um, archaeological sources um, are very scarce, uh, especially for textiles. We have just very, very small fragments preserved on metal objects. Um, the distribution of those objects can tell us a bit, but as Kaylee just said, we can't use any metal objects for the reconstruction. So I will just highlight a few, uh, namely a hairpin that was uh, found on the uh, right side of the head sometimes, which is again, uh, an indication for veils and probably worn in a sort of asymmetrical style. Then we have belt buckles uh, that indicate belted garments and very important two fibula that were sometimes found between um, a woman's legs. Uh, this is very sort of a typical style. Um, and also women wore knives um, on the right side of their leg. And one very important knife, <laughs> a very interesting one, was found in Maria Ponce, the very large burial ground that I mentioned before. Uh, and it's interesting because, as you can see here, there was a rather uh, large, for our period, <laughs> a piece of textile preserved um, that has very regular folds. So this is actually a pleated fabric, uh, which is a technique that is very time consuming uh, to produce and also uses up a lot of fabric. So for our purpose, you know, uh, recreating wealth and status in um, textiles, this was very uh, suitable. Um, pictorial sources, again, we know mostly from Italy and mostly from the 8th century. And again, there are not many depictions of women. Um, what you can see here is the Alta di Rathis um, from Italy, Cividale. Um, and you can see that this is actually very interesting for us because uh, Mary and Elizabeth are shown wearing garments with many folds. Um, now we can't be sure that they are depictions of pleated garments, but for this um, recreation, we are going to assume so. Um, this sort of garment, you know, long, uh, fully pleated has already been um, proposed as a possible reconstruction for pleated garments, and there have already been uh, at least one uh, graphical reconstruction. So um, we are more interested in another garment um, that is also shown on this altar, um, and that's uh, the red gown of the angels. Uh, the color surface has been recently reconstructed um, by uh, Laura Cinellato, an Italian researcher. Um, and those garments are very, very interesting. Why? Because uh, all the motifs are based on all the motifs. Uh, all the garments uh, are um, based on antique models and so on. But the garment of the angels seems to be unique. There is not really any pictorial source we can compare it to. 
Uh, you can see they're um, almost fully pleated, just the front is unpleated. Um, and here, I, I'm not sure if you can see, there are two bars um, in blue, uh, and they are at the exact same position where we can find a fibula in women's graves. So very, very interesting. The rest uh, of the garment, uh, for example, the, the longer undergarment uh, may also be based on depictions of Victoria. So there are also other parts from women's dress. Right, uh, so we needed to um, reconstruct uh, the cut. Normally, um, you're more concerned with like where to put inserts, where to put seams, so um, it fits the body. But um, a pleated garment follows some other uh, questions that are more decisive. Uh, and this gives us a real chance to reconstruct um, a, a cut with just this very, very small uh, find that we have. Why? Because uh, the way that the folds lay and where they are gathered is very visible in the pictorial sources because they are applied to patterned borders. Um, the only tricky part was actually just the arm. Uh, and here we made use of um, the full length of fabric by pulling uh, the, uh, the plates apart. Uh, and this gives us this sort of conical shape that you can see here. Um, right, to, to reconstruct the pleated fabric, uh, we used a fabric that um, corresponded to the find from Maria Ponce in terms of material, uh, thread count, thread um, diameter, um, and so on. Uh, then soaked it, put all the pleats in by hand, uh, and then fixed them with a thread every five centimeters. Um, the fabric was then uh, rolled up and wrapped uh, and steamed over boiling water for a couple of hours, then left to dry for a couple of days. And afterwards, um, after it was completely dry, the threads could be removed and um, the pleated fabric was done. So the other specialized textile technique we used to enhance the dress's appearance was tablet weaving. We know of two tablet woven fragments from Lombard period Low Austria, both of which we were able to integrate well into our reconstruction. One of these was also from Maria Ponce. You can see here figure 23. And this fragment consists of four rows of four threaded tablet woven cords of probably wool yarn consistently twisted in SZ, SZ, and with a plant fiber weft. Unfortunately, the complete width is of course not preserved, so we cannot say whether this is a simple ribbon without a pattern, or this part was just the border of a pattern band, which would make sense since the borders of tablet woven ribbons consist of simple cords in most cases. Yeah, and additionally, there is uh, a sewing thread on this ribbon, which suggests that it was sewn onto fabric as a border. The second archaeological, possibly tablet woven find we know uh, from Lombard period, Low Austria again, is mineralized onto a small iron fragment from a child's burial in Pottenbrunn, that's only 16 kilometers away from Mar Maria Ponzi. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to do any microscopic analysis on it yet, but it was previously determined to be tablet woven, and we at least have an illustration of the textile, which we were able to work with. We could maybe see, you can see it here, figure 24, uh, maybe we can see a diagonal pattern and a longer flotation here in the middle, and that might indicate something like a zigzag pattern. Nevertheless, we can't really be sure before we've analyzed it, of course. Outside of the Lombard culture, there are some isolated finds of tablet weavings in this period. In Austria, for example, we know of two small mineralized fragments from 5th century Gobelsburg and 6th to 7th century Unteräching in Salzburg. And outside of Austria, there are some well-known tablet woven finds, such as the borders of St. Batilde and Batil of Shell from 7th century Merovingian France. And other than that, we know of some remains of gold thread that was probably brocaded into tablet woven bands. 
Yeah, and if we look closer at the pictorial sources of Lombard Italy, especially the Ratkis altar, Anna just showed you before, we can see quite a few patterned borders on the bottom of seams and sleeves. And all of these patterns are the same with waved lines, though they might have been simplified on the relief to depict them. We, of course, cannot determine the weave of these borders by the reliefs, but tablet weaving is a technique that's quite suitable for weaving diagonals due to the cords that can be twisted in either direction, making the lines appear smooth. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we chose to integrate the two Lombard archaeological finds from Austria and the 7th century reliefs into the borders decorating the dress. We recreated the pattern depicted in the reliefs, as this is the only complete picture we currently have, and it could coincide with the Pottenbrunn find. For the line, we used two contrasting colours, madder red and world yellow, which are also two colours that have been found in traces on the Ratkis altar. The edges of the borders on the altar are not patterned, which maybe could represent the simple cords that are quite common in tablet weaving. And we used four of these on each side based on the Maria Ponce find using road and cochineal dyed wool. As we only have evidence of four threaded cords in the region, we threaded all tablets in this manner and two, two threaded tablets would also have been an option, of course, for the pattern part, as this was the case with some of the shell ribbons. Uh, the technique we chose was a 3-1 twill-like structure. So the tablets are all threaded with two of the same colors next to each other. And we based the number of tablets <coughs> on the approximate width of the borders on the italic reliefs. So this means we use 26 tablets 18 of them for the pattern and a warp thread diameter of 0.6 millimeters, which coincides with the diameter from Maria Ponzi. Though I must say the original ribbons could likely have been narrower though. Uh, for the weft, we used linen, like in the Maria Ponzi find again, that was about three times thinner than the warp threads. And as you can see here, for drafting the pattern, we used Microsoft Excel with every box representing a turn, uh, forward slashes representing Z twists, backslashes S twists. And I simply drew the zigzag line first, then filled in the remaining boxes in the tool structure. So this means weaving the two quarter turns forwards, followed by two quarter turns backwards, with the turning movements out of step with the neighboring tablets, thus creating a twill like double face structure. In order to make it simple and quick to read, we colored forward turns white and backward turns gray, assuming that all tablets are S warped and the pattern is red from bottom to top. Additionally, the slashes are colored in the respective pattern, which makes it easy for beginners to correct mistakes. This is especially important since we plan on using these instructions in workshops for visitors. And the ribbons were then sewn onto the bottom seam and the sleeves, just like in the depictions, using overcast stitches, which is based on, again, the finds from Maria Ponzi. Yeah, and as you may have guessed, um, this took quite a lot of time. Um, for the pleats, just fixing uh, about 10 centimeters um, of uh, fabric uh, along um, uh, 150 centimeters of uh, fabric. Um, this took um, 25 minutes and uh, working with just 10 centimeters, you end up with 3.3 centimeters. Um, then uh, the steaming took a couple of hours, the drying a couple of days, so this could easily uh, take a week to produce. And for an experienced tablet weaver, it took around 55 minutes to weave just 10 centimeters of this band with the diameter of these threads, which of course influences the weaving speed greatly. And although we both likely do not compare to the pace of a skilled textile worker, from the Lombard period, it 
may help us to get a better understanding of the value of such a gown. Um, if we have a quick look at the results, um, you can see Kaylee wearing the finished gown here. Um, and you remember that I said that we are not certain that uh, the depictions show pleated garments. Um, now, let's compare them uh, and uh, maybe have a look at, for example, the way that the um, pleats drape over, over a body and how they react to movement. Um, here you can see um, over Kaylee's um, thigh, uh, you have this very slight curve, same as is depicted, for example, here. Um, then remember the conical shape of the arms. Uh, you have a very kind of extreme uh, depiction of this here. Um, and then uh, when, when you're moving, when Kale is moving, um, all of the plates in, on the upper arm um, are in disorder, uh, and then they uh, get very neat on her lower arm, same as uh, you can see in this depiction, uh, very disorderly here and very neat below here. So I believe uh, it is at least uh, possible and very probable, maybe, uh, that those are actually depictions of pleated garments, which is very exciting. Besides garments serving basic needs, such as warmth, protection, they're also a medium for the expression of identity with which the wearer can present his gender, age, group affiliation, wealth, status, etc. And in the case of the Hauskirchen princess, the aim was to express her high status in the form of wealth without precious metals, instead only using textiles that are time consuming in production and requires certain knowledge and specialization from the artisan. These techniques, or rather the appearance, could have represented value themselves, being codes that were read and understood by the people of this period. The early medieval dress reconstruction showing this female Lombard garment will be used as a didactic tool at the Natural History Museum in Vienna, and it aims to visualize the appearance of a high-ranked person of the 6th century CE. The colors, as well as the pleating and tablet weaving, were de deliberately chosen by us to represent the high standards of handicraft of that time. The aim was also to prevent modern museum visitors' ideas of early medieval people just wearing primitive and simple garments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you um, both. Do, does the audience have any questions? <laughs> yeah, Petra. I think Magdalena was first, wasn't she? Uh, it was just more a comment than a question. So ah, okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Kelly and um, Anna <laughs> for your presentation and Karina also, of course. Um, um, you uh, made the reconstructions of the garments uh, of the gum by uh, with pleated sleeves, uh, but the uh, front and back of the garment was not pleated. So I wanted to ask. Uh, what is uh, your evidence for not pleating the front and back, but only the sleeves? I take that, maybe. Um, yes, at the back is in fact fully pleated. Um, oh. And the entire, but it's, no, it's not shown. Uh, it's not shown um, in the pictures. Uh, the back is fully pleated. The only thing that's not pleated is the front. Uh, and this is based um, on uh, the altar de Ratjes, the garment that the angels are wearing. Uh, and that's actually one of the uh, things that interested us. Um, and it's very good to uh, use in a museum because you have the contrast between pleated and unpleated uh, fabric right next to each other, you can, you can see the effect directly. Um, so this, uh, I have to say maybe, this is also based on uh, the proposed um, colored surface by Laura Cinellato. Um, and she uh, colored the front, um, the unpleated front and the pleated parts uh, in the same color. So I assumed it's the same, it's the same garment. Um, so that is the reason. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have to say in this concern that, of course, um, uh, what, what Anna explained is uh, right. And uh, it, it is a didactic uh, thing. This it, It's not a reconstruction or, or a replica of an actual thing. It's a recreation of specific visual, visual things and also handcraft details that we have in our archaeological evidence. And it's it's a very didactical thing in this in this kind. Yeah, for the museum, for different, yeah, also science shows. Magda, do you want to ask or do your comment? Yeah, it was more a comment about, I mean, uh, I'm of course uh, quite influenced because I took part to this wonderful workshop last week in Vienna, which like opened my mind to so many things. And uh, I'm just impressed how, I mean, it's exactly what you said. It was my impression when we had this mood board session that it was, uh, I realized how, yeah, how we like scientists just present our research the same way we do in conferences. And it's like, and, and I think like, yeah, sure. When I'm on also a visiting exhibition, I'm not really interested in reading these big panels with all the text. I want to see the object. And so, yeah, it made me think of a lot of, uh, yeah, of a new ways to communicate things. It was super, super instructive and, and yeah. So thanks again. And I think you do a wonderful job <laughs> at the Museum in Vienna. And uh, I think, yeah, I see many, many uh, heads rising and, but yeah, I'm not the chair. So Paula, I let you, <laughs> I'm finished. Well, my part is okay. I think Astrid had something to comment and then Cecilia. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I especially want to thank um, Karina Grömer because this was so inspiring for me because I will present our jewelry collection in Munich afterwards. And um, Karina, you showed me how you can do it in a museum perfectly. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> we can stay in contact and yes. uh, maybe we can come would, around and then we do some workshop. I would with really like my to. My wonderful students, you have seen their yes. presentation and... It's, uh, <laughs> I would really like to I go in contact with you. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, just thank you. You yeah. you can find me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, Yuri? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is actually uh, thank you to all your speakers. It was uh, such a joy to hear your presentations and to see you again. Thank you for a great time in Vienna. <laughs> but there's also a question from um, from YouTube actually from Anika Hammelink. Who, uh, who says, very interesting reconstruction. I wonder, how long did the peaks last? Did you need to do the whole process of stitching and steaming again after wearing it? Um, the pleats are still there, so we don't know how long they will last. Um, from, uh, from people that wear pleated, uh, hand pleated garments still today, we know that uh, they don't wash them. So this is just a garment that, that is an overgarment, so you don't have to wash it. And indeed, this, is, this, is, this, is, this doesn't seem to be a problem for people. Um, I would be very interested to see how it reacts to rain, but I'm not going to do that on the museum. <laughs> um, Anna, um, when did you make it in summer last year? Yeah, so it's almost yeah. a year old and it has been worn and... Yeah, it, it, it has worn on many occasions until now, also outside, but it was not raining. Uh, and it was also taken off and on uh, um, onto persons, for example, on Kaylee, but also uh, the puppet. And we also had it uh, on on our presentation for the workshop, and it was touched and 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 yeah, <laughs> stressed, so to say. But still, the pleats are there, and they are more or less as nice as they are. In, uh, as they have been when when they, it was freshly made, so some are more a bit more folded out, but but they are really very stable. We are we are wondering. We are really we are also impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and um, maybe let me add that, for example, the Hmong people in uh, Thailand and Laos, they they wear pleated skirts and they restitch them just for storage. So mm. when it's we haven't done that. But we will make, in summer, we will make a, a stress test for the pleated garment because Kaylee will uh, uh, wear it while riding on a horse. 
Because she is the princess of Hauskirchen. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the horse will also have to wear the reconstructed harnesses for the presentation at Deck 50. Yeah. Maybe in our next paper, we can show Kaylee on the horse as the full reconstruction with the right harness and so on. I mean the horse and, <laughs> and so on. Yeah, but in full motion. Then we can talk more about uh, performant, uh, performative aspects of such a pleated garment. Go ahead, Petra. Yes, uh, uh, one more uh, comment maybe I missed uh, that... Uh, what was the material um, of the pleated fragment uh, you found on uh, next to the knife? Because um, I also remember pleated garments from ancient Egypt, of course, and they are all from linen, uh, from linen, which uh, is very favorable to pleating and having pleats. Um, in place. So, do do you know the the material? We do. Yes, uh, it's wool actually, Ooh. and wool is used in I think all of the pleated garments that we have from that period, uh, also from other mm -hmm. contexts. And first, I was also I, I found it weird because I was more used to linen, um, yeah. but actually it reacts so well to the heat and and it stays in. So it's. Uh, different. I mean, I, I wouldn't have expected that before, but um, it's very suitable um, and they last very long. Uh, and I got um, a private message. Thank you. Um, and it also went into this direction. So I'm going to answer it here. Um, there are starched examples. So using starch to pleat. Uh, and before mm -hmm. I uh, created the entire uh, fabric, I looked into different techniques and also starching. So starching wool and not, um, not um, steaming it is also possible, but it's a little more scratchy and not as flexible. And then looking back at the, uh, at the depictions on the altar, I decided that they seem to be more soft and flowing folds. Um, well, I have a few comments if it's okay. <laughs> Uh, Karina, I really like your sentence on how to resonate research on the um, how textile is relevant to the daily life, because this is something sometimes I know that um, as researchers kind of forget to bring all of these, all of this great knowledge to the, you know, audience. And it's great that you found this way. Um, I personally love the work that you do recreating textiles. I feel like it's kind of similar because I recreate um, uh, recipes of natural dye, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> the work is very, very similar. And um, I've never actually considered the effect of sound, but like when you get, you know, when you gave the example of a lady that walks on high heels, you know, to have attention, I've never thought about the effect of sound on textiles and how, you know, maybe that's something that they've also kind of thought about. Uh, I have also a question for Kaylee and Anna. You mentioned, I'm going to be biased now, you mentioned some uh, natural <laughs> some natural dyes. Do you dye them? Do you dye the textiles yourselves? Or So the uh, pleated garment was chemically dyed with modern techniques, uh, but the, uh, the wool for the borders was plant dyed, not by me personally. <laughs> And it was mother, I remember you said mother, you used the dyes that you found on the textiles. Did I understand correctly? Uh, no, it's the, the colors that were found in traces on the relief, the pigments. We know those colors, but we only have completely mineralized textiles, so we don't know the actual dyes used yeah. in the Lombard period in Austria. But we know that these dyes generally existed in the early medieval period, so it's... Uh, Weld, madder, <clears throat> uh, wood, and cochineal. Yeah, I was wondering about the yellow. Thank you. Yeah. Well, maybe we can one like 
eventually join forces and we can buy your textiles with natural, you know, uh, historic recipes. That would be, yeah, would be great. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and uh, for, for the sound, it's just, uh, you, you might know that uh, uh, that there is uh, a plan for this anthology of Euroweb, Euroweb and we, we, we will do a, a specific paper uh, uh, together with Magda Wozniak and Cecile and also uh, uh, Audrey Goy. Uh, and we will do a paper on the sensory perception, the sound, feel, touch, and so on with garments and uh, in identity creating. And I'm looking forward to to work together with all of those wonderful women and researchers to to bring a nice paper. And then then maybe we can <laughs> put this push push this uh, aspect a bit forward. Magda, well, thank you that you agreed to to be part of our team. <laughs> and and Cecilia. I was just chatting now. <laughs> Side chat. <laughs> yeah, I think we will. Uh, yeah, we'll come like later after the conference to to all the speakers because it's a it's a project we want to uh, have everybody in. So, but I think yeah, we will have uh, more information at the end. Uh, I just wanted also to ask because it's like just strike me now because we were talking about this. Um, uh, uh, sensory archaeology, because you're just uh, talking about sound and everything. And I just remind yesterday, we had this discussion on the clavi and uh, the pur pur purple clavi. And this was the comment of, I think, Annika. She was said that it was purple, which was only, uh, could have been only worn by the elites and like normal people could have uh, any other color, but not purple. It was about the material. So I was wondering, was it possible on a visual basis to distinguish between uh, purple bands dyed with, I don't know, a mix of matter and, and wood, for example, and purple? Was it because I read something or heard something uh, a few weeks ago about uh, the specific odor of uh, like purple dye? So it was just a guess, like, could it be something we can take into consideration that we were passing and, and there was a specific odor or smell? of purple, which can allow you to distinguish just, yeah. Maybe it's too far, but it's just, just like things are connecting in my head and, okay. <laughs> um, Paula, I would uh, like to say something about um, about uh, dyeing. Uh, are you are you working with dyes? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because I study maybe, natural dyes, yes. <laughs> right. Because then maybe you would be interesting because uh, interested uh, because um, when the uh, the fabric was steamed, uh, the temperatures went up really really high to I think eighty three uh, degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, so I would actually be very interested to see uh, what it does to dye, what dyes uh, can be. Um, pleaded in this way and and what would be destroyed so that's that's an interesting you know uh, direction to go into further that would be a very interesting direction actually yes um one would assume that with high temperatures they would not be so um you know they're very sensitive to high temperature natural dyes however most of the uh, temperatures that were used to dye would kind of go to boiling point so it would be almost 90 degrees 100 Celsius degree. So they're very resistant in that sense. Yes. Are there any more questions or comments? I'm just going to check you too. Yes. I will just say at YouTube, I will just read out a comment from Annie Kamelink who says that Mohammed Gassin Nouira, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, does experiments with true purple dye. Look him up. That's an encouragement. And there are more people uh, working in this field. Uh, many, may, some of you might have participated in Lecce in the, in the workshop. Well, it's 10 years ago, so <laughs> time flies. But there's also a really nice publication there on uh, purple dye and some of these people, people working with experimenting on these dyes. So that was just from YouTube. OK, so maybe now we can move on to our next speaker, Dr. Astrid Fendt. I hope I said it right. Um, she's a senior curator at State Collections of Antiquities and Glyphotech Munich since 2012, before she was a scientific staff member at the Antiquesammlung Stachle Museum zu Berlin. 
she's a classical archaeologist and an art historian, as well as a trained stonemason. In her dissertation, she focused on archaeology and restoration, the sculpture editions in the Berlin Antiquities Collection of the 19th century. She's interested in ancient cloths and jewelry since she made a special exhibition in Munich in 2017 concerning divine versus design, dressing, antiquity. Astrid, go ahead. So oh, thank you very much. I share my screen. Okay. No, it's... Yeah. Okay, though, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, I'm very pleased to present the Munich Antique Co uh, Jewelry Collection as part of the Closing Identities Conference here. Yeah, jewelry is part of closing in all societies and part of representation through textiles. In antiquity, jewelry made of precious metals was reserved for the elite and showed the social status of the wearer. Since the Renaissance, antique gold jewelry in particular has been a popular collector's item and has also found its way into public museums. The Munich antique collections have a large stock of antique gold jewelry. Unfortunately, the reconstruction of the original ancient context is not always possible due to the history of the collection. Using selected examples, I would like to show and following my lecture, discuss whether and how we can speak today of ancient and modern identity formation through jewelry in the context of scientific cataloging and museum presentation. So I would also like to pose the overarching questions of the conference to the Munich Jewelry Collection. That is, how can we rethink and remake jewelry exhibitions in museums in a more inclusive way and discuss their colonial, ethnic, nationalistic and religious markers and symbolism? And second, how can we prompt interaction between jewelry collections in museums and the public? Yeah, for me personally, the starting point is a catalog project on antique gold jewelry. The, ju um, the jewelry collection in the Munich Antiken Sammlung Sammlungen comprises over 500 objects made of gold, silver, lead, iron, and gilded clay. They come from Greece, Italy, the Black Sea region, and the Near East from the second millennium BC to the fourth century AD. The jewelry has been collected since the early 19th century. So for all of you who haven't been to Munich until now, this is the Königsplatz. And here you see our two museums. On the left side, the collection of antiquities, Antikensammlung in German, and on the right side, the Klyptothek. So the jewelry, as you see, is on display in the Antiken Sammlung. And on the right side in the Glyptothek, we house our marble sculpture. So we have divided up um, our collections in, uh, in, in, in purpose of material, marble on the right side, and all the other materials and items. So clay, vases, bronzes, statuettes, glass, and the jewelry on the left side in the Antiken Sammlung. Yeah. The building of the antiquities collections also dates as the building of the Klyptothek in the early 19th century. Um, the Klyptothek was the first public museum in Munich and the Antiken Sammlung followed. So, and the jewelry exhibition is um, located in two places in the museum. Um, we have a selection of Greek, Roman and Near Eastern jewelry on display um, yeah, as a kind of preziosen nah, in a darker room in the, in the lower floor of the museum. It's a kind of um, treasury or meant as a kind of treasury room in the basement of the museum. And they're all uh, presented behind glass in glass cases. This is, um, as you all may see, a rather conservative and old fashioned way how we present it. And I got really good ideas how we could do it if we um, look at the Vienna um, Natural History Museum. <laughs> Yeah, in such a kind of chronological um, material-based presentation we have here, um, yeah, it goes down to the to the 19th century. There, the criteria of classification were um, developed, and the problem is in our museum that we cannot or we do not um, contextualize the um, the contexts of the finds. Um, mostly, they are unknown. Um, this is because most of our items came from the art market in the 19th century. So, but it can be assumed that the majority of the jewelry came from graves. 
The problem is that all the other um, objects from the graves um, or from the former ancient context, um, such as textiles or other graves goods are missing and we don't have them in the collection together with these um, jewelry pieces. Yeah, in the upper floor of the museum, we present our Etruscan jewelry collection. Um, this is also presented chronologically in uh, cases behind glass. Um, but we have reconstructed a Etruscan um, burial um, chamber, and in this chamber um, there is there are the, the vitrines with the um, jewelry. Yeah, the display situation hints at the former find context. Many of the jewelry pieces uh, come from graves in Vulci in Italy. However, um, we also here have no um, find context or excavation context. Yeah, using some examples um, of um, gold jewelry jewelry from southern Italy and from Etruria, I would like to show what function necklaces, bracelets, finger rings and earrings, but also rope appliques um, or funerary rests had for the societies of that time and what significance of the objects had in um, post-ancient times via the individual collection contexts. In the ensuing discussion, I would be delighted to receive suggestions on how we can exhibit our outstanding and famous gold jewelry in a more adequate and contemporary manner, and in what form a basic publication would make um, sense, and how yeah how how can I do it in a more <laughs> sorry, contemporary way? So I will um, begin with this outstanding object, our highlight. It's the gold rest from Armento. This is one of the earliest acquisitions of the antique gold jewelry in the early 19th century during the reign of our King Ludwig I. He was the founder of Glyptothek and of the Antiquen Sammlungen. Yeah, this um, gold rest comes from the collection of Caroline Murat. She was Napoleon's um, sister and married to Joachim Murat. And they too were the royal couple of Naples from 1808 to 1815. After her deposition and expulsion, Caroline uh, Murat ended up in Austria with her art collection. And there in Austria, um, Leo von Klenze, the art buyer um, of um, King Ludwig I, um, he bought her collection of antiques. Um, and among them um, was the famous um, gold rest by Armento. So yeah, these gold rests, we have some, some dates about the found situa finding situation. It was found on the 2nd of August, 1814, during excavations by a person called Colonello Sponza in the area of the ancient city of Grumentum in Southern Italy. And this is a very rich decorated funerary rest, um, a wealth of plant and flower motifs of bees, erodes and nikes unfold around a gold hoop. The rest was made at the end of the 4th century BC, and it served as a rest for the death and was given as a burial, burial gift. Yeah, it was never worn, but only served to enhance the prestige and the reputation of the deceased and the donor. And what is um, really um, special, we have an inscription on the basement of this Nike here in the, in the middle. Um, and this inscription says um, the name of a person, Critonius, and he gave the gold for the rest. So he was the uh, the donor of this um, gold rest. The inscription is unique. Um, the gold rest was clearly a prestigious object made for sole purpose of being a burial gift. Its weight is very, very low because all the elements were made of very thin um, sheet gold. So it's very flurry and, and, and light, yeah. So other early um, acquisitions come from the collection of Count Canino. This is mainly Etruscan jewelry. The Count of Canino was actually called Lucian Bonaparte, and he was also from the Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte family. He was the brother of him. Um, and he was made Count by Pope Pius VII in 1814. And as he owned um, extensive, extensive estates in northern Lazio and southern Tuscany, he um, carried out their excavations in the Etruscan necropolis of Vulci after 1828. Um, and after his death, um, Fruit Wilhelm von Tiersch, uh, from Munich, could acquire antique vases and Etruscan gold jewelry from his estate for the Bavarian king Ludwig I in 1841. So and among this um, Etruscan gold jewelry, there is this very interesting example of a prestigious man's jewelry, um, including this uh, lion's head bangle from the 7th century BC. The bangle is octagonal um, in cross-section. It consists of um, solid bronze, and this is covered with silver. And there are caps at both ends made of gold plate and they are attached to these ends. 
So under ornaments applied um, with granulation, which is typical for Etruscan jewelry, and uh, sh these ornaments show a lion's head and behind it some geometric ornaments such as zigzag lines and hooked meanders. Such a lion's head bracelet was probably worn in pairs as man's jewelry. There are parallels to this in the ancient Orient, and the lion, as you know, is a very typical symbolic um, animal for courage and strength. Um, it's a strange exotic animal for the society of that time, and it also stands for some extraordinary supernatural power. So also um, from the Etruscan um, fine spot um, from Wulchi and also connected with man is this um, golden pendant with hunting scenes. It probably served also as man's jewelry. It came from an Etruscan tomb in Wulchi. The pendant is one of the most important works of Etruscan goldsmith's art because of its um, extremely fine figural decoration of granules. Yeah, the centerpiece is enclosed by a silver hoop. Um, it was covered by a thin gold sheet. And on the top, um, there is an eyelet for a chain cord. Yeah, and the central uh, pendant uh, shows um, various hunting scenes. And here at the detail which I show, um, you see a man fighting a predator with a spear and the second predator approaches from behind. Above, there is running deer and stags. And all in all, the pendant shows various light and dangerous hunting scenes combined with an um, apparent ideal of nature. It comes from a graves. It marks the deceased man as a courageous hunter. And it can be assumed that um, warrior equipment, for example, was also given in this grave because the deceased would have been characterized as a skillful hunter and a brave fighter. Both virtues very typical uh, of man throughout antiquity. Yeah, this Etruscan disc earring from the Candelori collection um, from the late 6th century BC belongs um, to a representative, re representative female jewelry. It also came from a grave in Wulchi. And um, yeah, the Candelori brothers, um, I don't have a picture of them. Um, they excavated also in Wulchi at the same time as the before mentioned Count Canino. And they were um, competitors, um, these two um, parties who excavated. And King Ludwig's agent in Rome, Martin von Wagner, he bought some 600 vases, ancient vases from these Canino brothers in 1831. And also he bought um, um, antique gold jewelry from them. And this gold jewelry first came into the possession of um, King Otto of Greece, the son of Ludwig. And then afterwards, um, a yeah, hundred years later, it came into the Munich collections, in the house of the Munich collections in, 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 at Königsplatz. And so a good example of this or an outstanding example of this um, collection um, is this disc earring, this female disc earring. It has a dia dia diameter of six centimeters and was worn together with a second pair, um, a second plate as a pair. And it's a very extraordinary testimony of the Etruscan goldsmith's art because the decoration is also, again, um, the finest granulation. And this is very, very typical for that time. Circles with various motifs surround the flower in the center. Among them are frogs, the head of the Gorgo Medusa, um, and some shields, as well as flowers. Yeah, in ancient times, the frog was uh, regarded as a symbol of abundance. And the head of Gorgo Medusa is um, a lucky charm that awards of evil and protects the wearer of the earrings. Medusa heads are very typical jewelry elements um, in Greek times, Etruscan times, and this earring together with its counterpart was also found in an Etruscan grave. It also testifies to the wearer's wealth and um, her social prestige. Yeah, wall paintings um, in Etruscan tombs so sh uh, show such earrings. Now you can see, see it here at this woman. Um, I show you here an example of a fresco of the Tomba del Triclinio at Tarquinia in Etruria. Um, it's a repainting of this original wall painting and the original one dates from 470 um, BC. It shows two men and a woman at a symposium. Um, just a note, in contrast to the Greek times now, um, in Etruscan times, women could participate um, to such symposia. In Greek times, it was only prostitutes who were um, there together with the men. So, and we can see um, that this woman here from the upper class, she wears um, this big disc earring, also a necklace and bracelets. Yeah, and a very um, good example, a very exclusive example of an Etruscan necklace, um, I show you here. It also comes from the Candelori collection and was made in the late 6th century BC. 
It was found again in a thumb in Wulchi, and the necklace is not complete. It was modernly pulled again on a thread. It consists of golden hollow spheres with spirals of gold wire between them, and some of the balls are richly decorated with scales, drops, and leaf ornaments. And what is special, they have very, very fine gold dust granulation. Um, and these are gold beds of the finest granulation with a diameter of 0.2 millimeters. So this is really highest quality what we see here of this Etruscan jewelry work. Yeah, the problem with all these finds we have from the graves in Vulci, that is we have no documentation of the excavation or the opening of the graves in the early 19th century. And therefore, we cannot say anything about the further grave equipment. Yeah, we can only make um, hypothetical and retrospectively reconstructed statements about the buried. Therefore, in my opinion, an art collection such as the one in, uh, we have here in Munich um, has the task of addressing to the acquisition, acquisition context as well as the ancient context as possible. Yeah, the objects say a lot about the collector's taste in the 19th century. And since they were aristocratic collectors, they naturally wanted to surround themselves probably with gold jewelry, the most prestigious of all um, precious metals. Yeah, if you go on um, and go on in our collection history, I show you um, this nine centimeter long bow brooch from the second half of the first century uh, BC, also from, the, from a tomb. It was found in Southern Italy um, in the countryside of Campania. And it represents in, in terms of art history, a uh, further development of the ancient Italian sanguisa, sangu, sanguisuga form. And granulation is here also used, but far less than in the typical Etruscan jewelries. Um, the granules are distributed on the bracket and form decorative elements together with filigree tendrils and palmets. The finial of the pin rest is a gold plate cuff set with flowers and a pomegranate blossom with fruit. Such um, ceremonial brooches were used for fastening and closing garments, as you all know, and the pomegranate is a very uh, typical fertility symbol. Yeah, this late um, classical Etruscan, uh, this late classical southern Italian bow brooch came from the collection of the American banker and art scholar James Loeb, who he lived in Munich, um, uh, or he moved to Munich uh, at 1900, and he purchased on the art market in Italy around 1900, and he. Um, bequeathed his very large collection of ancient small art to the Munich Antiken Sammlung um, at his death in 1933. Yeah, and um, finally, to end this speech, I um, show two Roman finger rings that clearly indicate to us their purpose at the time based on their decoration. Yeah, this one here is um, a very nice ring. It's a bridal ring uh, from 175, uh, 57 AD. And it's not a, a wedding ring, but it's an engagement ring. Yeah? The bride received uh, this ring from her groom before the wedding as a pledge of love and loyalty. This is indicated by the two interlocked hands. They symbolize the, yeah, the, the, concord, the concordia and the fidelity, fides. Um, and in the addition, the bride received the, um, an, an engravement at the outside of the ring. And it says in, in Latin language, sit in eum concordi. Animo. This means, yeah, the, the groom said to her, let her be of one mind toward him. Yeah. The two portrait um, heads depict, uh, they depict the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius and his wife Faustina. So we can date this ring in, at their um, reign time. Yeah. And they also, these pictures of these two um, emperors, they um, refer to the custom, custom in Rome that engaged couples in the city of Rome offered a sacrifice before the statues of the imperial couple in the temple of Venus and the temple of Rome at the Roman Forum. So in our, our ring, he does not come from the capital of Rome, but he was found in a Roman estate um, near the village of Rheinheim in Saarland, Germany. And it was found in um, 1830 and ended up in the collection of King uh, Ludwig in, in Munich. So K Ludwig here often got um, yeah, presents from other, from other regions of Germany. So it might have been a present to him. So and yeah, to end, I will end with this uh, Fidem ring, with this Troje ring. Yeah, it's this Roman um, fidelity ring. It comes from the city of Augsburg in southern Germany. And it was found there in 18... Um, 67 and into the blade um, was stuck the word freedom also meaning faithfulness um, and in the ring 
um, the name Constantino was engraved. Um, this means the wearer of the ring is considered to be asked to give allegiance to Constantine. Yeah, and the, the, the diameter of the ring, as well as the, the subject, makes clear that it's a man's finger ring. And such rings were awarded to higher officers and troop commanders, um, maybe by the emperor himself, in order to distinguish them in a special way. Here we are dealing with Emperor Constantine the Great, who ruled um, from 306 to 373 um, AD. And he had a strong interest um, to to a close um, to close ties with his military persons. So yeah, with these um, two rings, I will end my presentations. It's just a small look in our really famous and big collections, over 500 pieces. Yeah, and I, I thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to the discussion because we are standing here a bit at the at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I will do a, a cataloging of these items, but the question is, yeah, how to do nowadays a good cataloging um, together with yeah, new presentation and contemporary pre way of presentation, these prestigious materials in, in our house. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Astrid. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question? Let me see if there's someone on YouTube. Maybe we can wait a little bit. In the meantime, I have a question. You showed this golden light necklace with um, gold granules in it, which was really beautiful. Do you have any idea? This is um, maybe it's a silly question. How they were able to do that? It's so like tiny and it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, this is really amazing. And I mean, we know how they make the granules or how you can make granules, but these really, really fine things, it's, I think we should do a bit more um, as, as as the others do and on, on um, how to say, on, on recreative um, yeah, um, ideas or we should work together with tool, modern day jewelers. And I do a bit with one person in Munich, but she also says this kind of fine granulation she cannot make. She makes bigger ones now like this. Um, one or two millimeters, but this was 0.2 millimeters fine. So this is really a difference. And I mean, the, the way how to do the granules is is known, but to do these really fine ones, this is very 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 hard and very long a long 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 work. Yeah. So nobody does it nowadays anymore. Yeah. So it's the type of work that it's so thorough that it's kind of been lost over time. Um, yes, it's lost, and I, I must. Uh, we should do really the, the some experimental um, archaeology and, and and look if it's if if you could do it. But nobody does it anymore. I mm -hmm. asked one person, and she said no. She has contacts, and she she does it. She does it in a, in a more not this fine way. She can't do it in this. Um, yeah, fine thing. well, the necklace was unbelievable. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have time for more questions, if anyone wants to ask. Oh, Cecily, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Hello, and uh, thank you for this presentation. It was really, really interesting. You have a fascinating collection. It's just more of a comment, not so much uh, as a question. It's um, I like the idea of counterposing some of the jewelry with, for example, the Etruscan jewelry with the wall paintings, where you find parallels. I think that could work. I know you're already doing it, as you've shown on the slide, in a way, but maybe to do it even more like one to one in a way. I just grabbed our own catalog. We have like these facsimiles in our collection, and I think that could work really really well just as one aspect of course that's only the Etruscan collection where are some really good uh, comparisons as you already know too much of this Etruscan jewelry in the in these wall paintings I think mm. well, maybe I'm biased because <laughs> but I find that very interesting so maybe that's something you can expand on and, and generally like to look for parallels in iconography and use that in the mm. exhibition but you already yeah. thought of that. Yeah, yeah, Cla Cla I mean, we are not actually, we will not re recreate our uh, presentation. We, we will do it when we uh, have a big restoration project for the whole museum. Then this mm -hmm. will start, but we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
money of doing this, but you have to now you have to work in advance a bit with the ideas how you can how you can change the presentation. And mm -hmm. as we don't have these um, fine spots, we can't we can't recreate a whole um, burial, for example. We only have these precious materials. It's, it's, it's more Schatzkammer. Ne? We have, yeah. and so we can do it with the Etruscan wall paintings. That's good and and easy now to do yeah, and, and i think really good and we should do it in this way but also we have this rich collecting history also a bit now to show from which persons do these things come and what what intention they have so it's always like a mixture but yeah i like the the way they, they do it in vienna so we should, we should get there a bit yeah yeah uh, yeah they're, they're doing excellent work for inspiration but yeah i'm also interested to hear that yeah you will do a a re-exhibit of your collection of antiquities. We will do the same. Well, we're working the same thing in the Glyptotech, and it's just a huge task. Uh, yes. We don't have so much jewelry, but of course we have a big Etruscan collection as well. And yeah, I, I heard about your project, and I would be really interested to see how you go on and what kind of... Yes, <laughs> and likewise, <laughs> maybe we can stay in contact because, I, yeah, I think actually maybe me and my colleagues would like to come and visit, and maybe you would like to come here I to come discuss. to Copenhagen in June. At yes, first of June, so maybe we could arrange a meeting. Yes, <laughs> please come and visit me in the museum yes. if you have the time. You're more than welcome, and yeah, yeah, yeah then we yeah, can yeah, discuss exactly. more. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, Magda. Yeah, just um, because uh, I, I think the, the the building was built on purpose. Yes, to to display the collection, uh, did I understand? Um, um, no, no. Uh, the, the one, the Glyptothek was built on purpose to display the ancient marble collection, but the antique Sammlung, the other house where now the jewelry is in, this was built um, in 1840 for, um, for, for contemporary art. So um, the antique collection came into this building after the Second World War. The building was, but it was re recreated, yeah, after the Second World War to present the antique collection. And mm -hmm. so this idea of having the gold jewelry in the basement in this kind of dark, um, yeah, prestigious uh, jewelry chamber, this idea came from the 1960s, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> we still have no, because it, it, was, it was an interesting perspective. Yeah. I was wondering yeah, how, how you came to that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it's very old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. If there are no more questions, maybe we can go to our break. Thank you so much, Astrid. Yeah. Um, and we can meet, well, we're a little bit earlier, so we can meet at 10, at 11, sorry, as scheduled. So in half an hour. See you soon. Uh, yep. <laughs>
Hello, everyone. Hi, hi. Uh, Paula, I just uh, sent back again the link to our next speaker, so I hope she will be joining us soon because I don't see her on, on Zoom yet, so maybe we can just wait a minute. Yeah, we can wait. It's not a problem. Yeah, I'm spotting the, the conference mailbox, so... <laughs> So let's just wait a little bit to see if um, Yegis uh, can join us. Okay, so maybe we should um, move on to the next speakers and then when Yegi's joining us, he can do his presentation. Would that be okay for Morton and Camilla? Oh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Would that be okay? Sorry. <laughs> yes, just uh, a second. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna introduce the speaker. So 
Martin uh, Krimel Hansen uh, has a um, master in history. He's an independent scholar associated with the Center for Textile Research. And he's especially interested in fashion history and archive based studies, as well as the historiography of textile research in Scandinavia. Camilla uh, Nielsen has a master degree in history. He's, she's a curator at the Museum Amaga. She is in charge of the museum's collection of folk dresses and is working on incorporating traditional dress in new exhibitions and online branding with a focus on dissemination aimed at children. Together and separately, they have published articles on the history of the traditional dress on Amaga and are now working towards a project on morning dress and traditions on the islands. Go ahead. Thank you. And uh, can you see the no. screen? We can, it's just not in um, presentation mode. Do you wish to put okay. it? Yes, we will try again. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Stop, uh, stop to share screen. And then if you do like this. Oops. Okay. Maybe you should do like this. Um, <laughs> so if you don't have it on presentation mode, you first share your PowerPoint and then in your PowerPoint, you put the presentation mode. Okay, thank you. We'll try that. Yeah. And then. And now presentation mode. Why does it not work? I I don't know. It doesn't seem to do anything. Well, it, it, it's okay. If you don't okay. mind presenting like this. No, it's okay. I think okay. perfect. We will just do like so. We just, we just do like. yeah. We can see the slides moving. So yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. But. Uh, so uh, first, a uh, uh, short introduction to uh, the Dutch immigrants on Amma, um, who wore this kind of youth you're going to be hearing a little bit about uh, in a moment. Um, the Dutch immigrants received a, uh, sorry, just to start, uh, start off, um, Amma is a island quite close to Copenhagen, and it's um, quite a green island where there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of farming. And in uh, 1521, around that period, uh, the Christian king, uh, the Danish king, sorry, Christian II, invited these Dutch immigrants to Amma to farm these lands and kind of um, get all these like uh, vegetables to his queen, who was also from the same area of the Netherlands. And these Dutch peasants, they, um, they received these very special privileges from the king and was kind of known to be the king's peasants. And within this small little community on Amma, they kind of created their own little uh, society with their own rules, government, and their own uh, way of dressing themselves that was quite uh, different from the rest of the country. And this um, unique culture they ended up having and still see little bits of on Amma is still something that has like um, um, have have some, uh, some history from both Denmark and the Netherlands. <coughs> yes. Um... And this is, of course, also part of the traditional dress of the of the descendants of the original Dutch peasants. And so I would uh, try to describe the, the Jup and the morning dress quite briefly. And the Jup was a part of women's morning dress among the Dutch peasants on Amma. It is unknown when the Jup came into use, but it went out of use around 1880. It seems to have evolved from a more general practice of veiling and concealing the face to show grief, as well as peasant women using their skirts as overcoats. And in the collection at Museum Amma, there are two uh, examples of uh, original Jupe. The Jupe is essentially a skirt made from a dark cloth of sheep's wool. It is put on like a skirt and fastened at the waist 
but uh, inside out, with the hem facing out. Then it is pulled up over the upper body and drawn over the head to conceal the face in accordance with the wearer's relationship to the deceased and how much time had passed since the death occurred. The front of the skirt was pulled up and tied with a band below the chest, and the wearer bent their arms and stuck out their elbows to the sides and thus created a fuller figure, almost triangular. On the back, a part of the group was decorated with a colorful silk band upon horsehair linings, which created this look of a fan or peacock tail uh, on the wearer. And here you can see a painting uh, from the 1800s by the Danish painter Julius Exner, who painted uh, several of um, the traditional dresses on Amar. Uh, and here this fan or peacock tail uh, is somewhat larger than the examples we know to have uh, to have existed. Uh, so it is true, clearly this uh, part of the dress that fascinated him. And uh, the Europe has since been used by several other painters and as well as photographers in modern times uh, as object for their art. And as I briefly mentioned, there was, of course, a more broad uh, practice of veiling among peasants, not just on Amma. And here uh, you can see a photo of a, a woman from the German island of Fur, who also has her skirt uh, drawn up over her head as part of their uh, mourning dress. But on uh, Amma, from, we know from uh, the 1700s, they also used uh, a skirt similar to the Yub, but it was called a market skirt or uh, and these so-called market women who went to the market in Copenhagen to sell their produce, they wore it uh, uh, as an overcoat um, on the travels to Copenhagen. So what remains of the youth? Um, unfortunately, very few sources has survived about it. And to this day, we are not quite sure how to actually put this dress on because it is quite a, um, this garment, because it is quite hard to see. Um, to put it on and you can really like dress yourself in it. You have to have someone else to help you uh, put it on. At the um, Museum Ama, we have a local dress expert who is Michael Pedersen, and she has been kind enough to make a, make a replica of this Europe and kind of trying to put together some pieces in how this uh, garment should be correctly put on because there's quite a lot of few details that have to be correct or be followed to make this um, this correct presentation. And it's also a little bit important to note when I say the correct presentation that we're not sure that it was a 100% uh, similar way that all women kind of put this garment over the head. It's just something we're assuming. Um, but uh, there are some few things that have survived that we know that they're supposed to, to be set in a certain way. Uh, the greatest source to, to not only the youth, but also some of the other AMA dresses are Ellen Mugden's um, book written in 1932, where she made this complete um, kind of overview over all these kind of dresses and garments that these women and men have worn on the island of AMA. And she was also fortunate enough to interview some of these women who remember how these kind of dresses were put on and so on. So we only have partial knowledge. We have to guess a little bit when it comes to this dress, uh, but we have kind of like worked out a, um, a way that kind of works um, in a way that we can see fit for it. Yes. <clears throat> so as mentioned, we have uh, several objects of art that use uh, the Yube and as well as other dresses. Um, so uh, the visual side of it, the finished product, so to speak, is uh, we are quite sure of. Um, but there's also the question if something is lost uh, in the art when it is just, so to speak, just uh, an object for art. Uh, and as mentioned, we see that uh, in Julius Exner's paintings that some parts of the dress ex is uh, exaggerated and some parts may seem to be have been left out. So. It's not uh, the exact dress you see there. And when Elna Mygdale collected information for her book published in 1932, 
as Camilla mentioned, she interviewed uh, some older ladies who had worn uh, the yub in their youth, and they uh, agreed that the purpose of the yub was to hide the sorrow, um, which is quite interesting, we think, seeing, since we often look at morning dress as a way of showing uh, sorrow, showing how you are in mourning. And this actually became uh, the facilitator for this project. Mm -hmm. How can we uh, understand this uh, since it seems to uh, be at odds with our modern perception of it? Yeah. So these next few slides, I will kind of show how uh, the U was put on me. And as you can see here, uh, I'm starting off with getting the um, like a um, Soul dress that you will wear after this. Um, it should be said here, I think we forgot to mention it, that this garment, the yu, was only worn while you were in church and while you were kind of like walking to church to kind of like hide your sorrow up when you're walking to the church. And you could, there's this um, quite fabulous uh, drawing or painting of all these women walking with a, um, a man next to them, kind of guiding them up to church or to the church to have the ceremony. So under the youth, you will wear like a traditional sorrow dress, as you can see, I'm being put in right here, uh, like all these different kind of skirts, and of course, all these um, you know, like little caps around my head as well, that kind of helps uh, keep the youth in place as well. And it, um, we can also see maybe the first pictures that uh, Martin is putting some small needles in the scarf, and that is so it's been, uh, so it stays in the correct uh, place the whole time and doesn't slide off in the middle of walking. So the whole garment under it is also quite secured with all these needles so you don't end up having like uh, bits of your clothing falling apart because you have to hold your hands in a specific way. I don't know if you can see it. If you can stand up here, sorry. You have to hold your hands in this kind of like specific way when you're walking to kind of like the youth takes on this correct look. So it's very important that all the rest, rest of the dress under it is kind of put in this correct place. So the needles are a bit helpful there. As you can see here, there's a fuller picture of the dress that is worn under the yoke, and you can see these very dark colors. And you can also see the skirt here, uh, the way it's made. It's um, dyed with some, some blue, we presume indigo right here. And of course, there's this dark colors that is very traditional for the sorrow in Northern Europe. And here it becomes quite interesting. The first picture, you can see this uh, red band, uh, the U band. And this is one of the things where we are not 100% uh, sure how it is put on. And it's something we had some discussion about yesterday, actually, if there was a correct way to put it on or if it was something that was kind of like put on in the most... And a bit, I'm a bit careful with the practical way, but maybe in a way where <laughs> the kind of like the dress has been put a uh, kind of like hold up. But what we do know about it is that it's not something that um, people from like outside, like viewing the U from the outside to be able to see. It's something that should help uh, keep the U in the correct place. And you can also see the color is, uh, it's kind of, yeah, it's like a, a red color. So it kind of like would break with the front of the U, which is like in these dark colors. And then of course you have to find on the back with all these like beautiful colors. And then the next slide, you can see how this uh, is put on me, or the garment is put on. And I had this notion before getting this dress on that it would be very heavy because everyone around me was kind of telling me it's going to be very heavy, you're going to be very uncomfortable, it's going to be, uh, you're going to feel kind of like, um, like you want to take it off as quickly as possible. And I had this notion in my head while having it put on. And then at some point, I kind of stopped and was like, it doesn't feel heavy, it doesn't feel uncomfortable, it actually feels like a nice warm hug and I kind of feel like I'm in my own little world at this moment I can kind of like um, I don't have to worry about uh, keeping uh, my eyes with someone if, if I could kind of like see myself and this of course a speculation if I was crying at this point I can probably just worry about that and not be worried about how other people perceive me so I can kind of see how this works as a, um, a kind of like a small private room for yourself what was a little bit uh, interesting was of course my my hearing was the the sense I was most um, kind of using the most because I had to listen to people telling me where to go and kind of get a little bit of help. And the fan on my back, you see that in a, in a short moment, you can see it right here. The fan here, you can also see the finishing product, was kind of helping 
Yeah, kind of like bending my back. It was uncomfortable at all, but kind of bending my back a little bit forward. So I kind of took this position where I kind of like was looking a little bit down and kind of had this like a heavy garment, or not so heavy, but this garment under me. And of course, with my arms and everything else. So all in all, it was kind of a very interesting experience to, to wear it. It wasn't uncomfortable. It felt like I had my own private room to, to stay in. I was, of course, more in tune with my hearing and I could also feel my breathing a lot more than I would usually do because of this garment over me. So it was like something I was more aware of. But this is the finishing product, as you can see. Um, this very beautiful fan at the back, as well as you saw on Exodus painting. And also this kind of like, I think it's a very beautiful dress. Uh, I'm a little bit <laughs> subjective there, but I think it looks, it's an incredible look. And it was also something that you are very much in tune with your own body. And of course, this like the feeling of this, this garment. <clears throat> yes. So we have begun these um, sensory uh, analysis to say, to call it that, uh, through trying to wear parts of uh, the unit, wearing it all together uh, and wearing it outside, inside and in different lights in different circumstances in order to see how would it, uh, how does it feel, how does it, uh, how do you react in it and can we get somehow closer to um, the experience of uh, the wearers of the past. And then while looking into this, we also began uh, thinking about new immigrant communities on Amma, which has a considerable community of uh, uh, Muslim immigrants. And there are a, another completely different veiling practice among uh, some of these uh, groups of immigrant women. But what is interesting is that as has uh, been shown in uh, in uh, uh, newer research, they people who are veiled experience it differently than people who do not uh, practice this. And it might be interesting to include these women in our uh, sensory discoveries and research on the group in order to get new perspectives, so that. Uh, it is not always about uh, the outside looking in, being on the outside and looking in. So we are, uh, have begun uh, to establish contacts with uh, these communities and, and want to include them in a future uh, exhibition on the sensory aspects of veiling among immigrant communities on AMA. And perhaps also how uh, keeping such a practice both for the Dutch peasants and now for uh, Muslim communities, uh, how what it means to keep these practices uh, when uh, immigrating to a new country. And we uh, have uh, begun collaboration with the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, especially uh, uh, a master student, uh, Nana Isabel Mesic, who has uh, created her own version of the group in the modern times, which you can see here. Uh, so again, how would it appear visually if created today? Uh, what would it be used for and mm -hmm. how would it feel? And what meaning uh, do these uh, practices and these dresses have? And so, yeah, and of course, we kind of hope that um, we're in the start process right now of uh, ending up with a, a final product that we can use for an exhibition that we would um, have hopefully next year around this time. And we will include uh, this yoke and some of the other dresses that uh, Nana has made. And, um, it should be said, if any of you want to hear some more about her research and, some, and her work, you are more than welcome to write me. She has done some very like interesting discoveries and made some very like beautiful dresses. You can also have a look on her social media and see those as well, if you're interested in that. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
um, Morton and Camilla. I really thought it, this was a really interesting paper, very different from the other ones. And I really enjoyed, especially when Camilla was describing how her perception when she wore the the veil completely changed and it was like you were in your small world so maybe that's why they say hide the sorrow you know maybe because the sorrow is something so individual and they wanted to feel it without exposure to the external world so that was really really interesting thank you You're um does the audience have any questions comments Check on Zoom. May yes. I? Max. Yes. Uh, um, uh, because uh, you mentioned that you could have been um, able to interview some of the women who they themselves wore the job. And I mean, but on the other hand, we lost the, the way of, of wearing it. So... Uh, I, it's something I think I missed in in the narrative. Um, yes, um, well, Elna Mute, who was a press scholar in the uh, early and mid uh, 20th century, she was able to interview these okay. women. Okay, and sorry, so, sorry, I missed that point and, and that's something. Yeah, so so it, we are basing it on, on her uh, material. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any more comments? Yeah, Anna. Thank you. First of all, this was extremely fascinating. Uh, I have one question uh, because I noticed that um, the skirt is pleated. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> and I would be interested uh, whether it's starched or if you know, or maybe have any literature that you could send me uh, where there is more information on how this was done. Um, and also I noticed that uh, some of the um, feelings that you described when, when, when you wear this yerb uh, is very similar to what uh, friends uh, have told me how they feel when they have to wear a face mask that is actually very relaxing that they don't have to have, you know, a friendly or an expression in public. Um, and I believe that you worked on this during the pandemic. Has this in any way like occurred to you or influenced um, how you felt about this? Actually, while you're saying it right now, I can't go on for me. <laughs> so it's a little bit uh, quite interesting because um, I actually had the same like personal um, like personal feeling um, or like experience with like wearing a face mask. And I actually sometimes can miss a little bit because <laughs> I don't feel kind of like... Um, yeah, it's kind of like the same feeling, actually. So it's like a very interesting uh, um, perception of it. So thank you so much. That's definitely something that could be included. So like, uh, yeah. Yeah, because it's really nice. Yeah. It is very interesting. It's all about creating these uh, private rooms mm -hmm. in a public setting. Yeah. Uh, so, which is really fascinating. Yeah. I, uh, and something to look into. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> but I will definitely, um, I can send you some, if you uh, send me a mail, I can send you some, uh, some information. I can also send you some close-up pictures and I can also put you in contact with some people who actually make these kind of like uh, skirts still, actually, like make some kind of like the same, um, um, what do you call it? Like, bleeding. Yeah, yeah, bleeding. So I will look into it if you want. You can just write me an email and I will put you in contact. Thank you. Um, no more questions, comments? No? Okay. So thank you so much, Morton and Camilla. This was wonderful. And now we see that Yegis is already here with us. So maybe we can have his presentation before moving on to um, Anna and Maria, if that's okay. Yegis? Are you here? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sharing Kiege's presentation, if that's okay. And uh, please just let me know if now uh, it's in the we see presentation that mode. Already here with us, so maybe we can have his presentation before moving on to um, Anna and Maria, if that's okay. Kiege's? Yes. 
Are you here? Yeah. I am here. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have like the YouTube on and it's um, doing some echo. I don't know. Uh, could you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, I will speak about Urartian textile in Armenia. Uh, Let me just do your introduction first, very quickly, <laughs> so that people know. So Yegis um, graduated in chemistry from the University of Yerevan in Armenia and the University of Rome La Sapienza. For many years, she has collaborated with the Matena Daran Museum Restoration Department in Yerevan for the identification of color and tin manuscripts for the authentication, restoration, conservation, and determination of their provenance. She was involved in various European projects, and in 2011, she was elected to the board of directors of the International Council of Museums Conservation Committee. She's a member of ICOM, Lecturer Chemistry for Restorers at Instituto Centrale per il Restauro e la Conservazione del Patrimonio Archivistico e Librario, and recently became a member of the European Association of Professors Emeriti. She will present this paper along with colleagues Michele Badalian, Alessandro Cicola, Ilaria Serafini, and Professor Roberta Cudini. Go ahead, Yegis. Oh, just one thing. Um, Magda, we can see your not the full screen, but the presenter's view with the comments. That's okay. And uh, just, just let me know if now uh, it's in the presentation mode. Here with us, so maybe we can have his presentation before moving on to um, Anna and Maria. Yes. Yes. Are you here? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> you probably have like the YouTube on and it's. Uh, oh, is it okay? okay? Yes, now it's okay, Magda. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you so can start you. when you want. Uh, could you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Uh, how to I will, uh, uh, I will oh, no, no, no. speak about Urartian textile in Armenia. Uh, Let me just do your introduction first very quickly <laughs> so that people know. Uh, yeah, you, do you have some uh, lag in your right. YouTube or some oh of Yerevan in Armenia? and the University of Rome La Sapienza. For many years, she has collaborated with the Matena Daran Museum Restoration Department in Yerevan for the identification of color. Yegis, do you have some lag in your YouTube? Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. You can start. In Armenia. Uh, how to go next? How to go next slide? Oh, uh, I am doing it for you. It's Magda from this side. I have your presentation opened and I think it's now shared in full, full, full screen. Yes. Yes. So I am on the right slide, or, or do you want me to go next? Next, yes. Okay. So the map is okay? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Second slide. Second slide, here. I have the title and the, the second slide is this one. Okay. 
car waiting for a friend of mine to go hiking. And I was thinking to myself, why is Urartu is an ancient country of Southwest Asia, centered in the mountains, mountain of the region southwest of the Black Sea and southwest of the Caspian Sea. Today, the region is divided among Armenia, Eastern Turkey, and Northwestern Iran, mentioned in Assyrian sources from the early 13th century BC. Urartu enjoyed considerable political power in the Middle East in the 9th and 8th centuries BC. The Urartians were succeeded in the area in the 6th century BC by the Armenians. Next. Audio, next. Hello. Yes, the the one. Uh, please go <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Uh, go ahead without. This is the Urartu, Urartu map of the Urartu. The information we have about textiles is oh do you know? Go back, please. Go back. Yes, I am. Uh, are, are you following me on YouTube or on Zoom? I um, think you are following her on YouTube. You should be in Zoom. Yeah, you should be in Zoom because YouTube yes. has a small lag, like two or three minutes. So please follow us via Zoom. You can close your YouTube channel and just be in Zoom. That's fine. You don't need uh, YouTube to be open. Just close it. I think maybe that will help. Okay. Go. Go next uh, slide, please. Which slide do you need? Next slide. Can you, what is on the slide you need? Next slide. May I see it? I'm now with the ancient walls of Eshebaini at Carmel Blur. Is this one? Next, next one. Okay, okay. The information okay. we have about Urartian textiles is quite scat. Oh, why you change it? No, because you're seeing us via YouTube, Yegis. The YouTube uh, has a small lag. You really need to meet us in Zoom, otherwise this will be very complicated. Uh, I should go to Zoom? To Zoom, yes, please. Yes. Okay. Close down YouTube, please. Okay. Next, next one. Okay, okay, okay. The information we have about rat and textiles. But you need to one. shut down YouTube because no. we can hear you. Why are you changing? No, because you're seeing us. Oh my God, Hilde. Have you closed YouTube? Yes. Perfect. Are you yes. following us via Zoom? Yes. What is the slide you're seeing in Zoom? This is, I don't know. You should go back. Okay. This one. The information we have about art and textiles. Is this one? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Perfect. Oof. Not YouTube. It's okay, I guess this sometimes can be complicated, but I think we now have the correct slide, so you can start whenever you feel ready. Uh, go back, please. Mm -hmm. Back. Okay, now, the information we have about Urartan textiles is quite scarce. 
archaeological remains of textiles have been found at the sites of Carmir, Pelur, Patmos, Toprakala, and Ayanis. Unfortunately, comprehensive studies on textiles found in the above mentioned at Urartian antiquities have not yet been conducted. A study of burnt textiles found at the Carmir Pelur site can provide a wealth of information on Urartian. Why you change it? I am not changing. Yegis, you are still on YouTube, I think. I, I don't am... know how to close this YouTube. And this, unfortunately, comprehensive studies of textiles found in the book mentioned that Urartian antiquities have not yet been conducted. Could you go the to this of... like, small cross up uh, on your window and just... I, I don't see your computer, so it's difficult for me to, to give you any advice. But it, do, do you I see all the speakers in Zoom? Yeah, you are still on YouTube, I think. I don't know how I to know close how this, to close YouTube. this YouTube. YouTube. How to close it? Yeah, Mamma mia. Paula, perhaps could you, I will stop sharing just a moment, perhaps. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And perhaps we can uh, have this uh, small break slide, so we just fix it. We take two minutes. Okay. Uh, Yegis, uh, yes. are you able to see all the small screens with the speakers? Yeah, I think she's still on YouTube, so it's difficult to communicate. Um, How maybe... to close this YouTube? <laughs> so, yeah, do you have like a Google Chrome or an Internet Explorer, something that it's open? Yes, yeah, Google Chrome. Close Google Chrome. Is it closed? Yes. Do you see, do you have oh, your? No. Okay. Okay. Do you see us? Yes. On Zoom. Yes. So now, if Magda shares her, okay, your presentation. Okay. Now it's okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Magda, can you share? Yes, yeah, sure. <sighs> okay, okay, I share again. Uh, okay, here. And so, do you see the presentation, Yanis? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, so which slide I should go? Uh, next, um, next slide. Okay. This one? Yes. Okay. The Carmel Blue Red Hills site is located in the southwestern part of the capital of, of the Republic of Armenia, Yerevan. The hill was covered with soil and had a reddish appearance. That is why the locals named the area Carmir Blur. Excavations at the site began in 1939 with some interruptions and continued until 1971. Archaeological excavations in Carmir Blur in 1949-52 revealed many remains of burnt textiles. In 1951 and 52, in the northern part of the fortress, along with many other items, a piece of hard woolen cloth was found in an oval basket. Next. Karmir Blur on Teixebaini, uh, referring more to the hill that the fortress is located up, up and was the capital of the Transcaucasian 
pro provinces of the ancient kingdom of Urartu. It is located near the mo modern city of Yerevan in Armenia. The site was once a fortress and governmental center with towered and patrician perimeter walls, massive gates, a parrot ground within its walls and storage rooms that entirely occupied the ground floor. The site of the city, Thales and Citadel together measure over 110 acres. Next. This is, these are the ancient walls of Teshebaini at Carmel Blur. Stone at the bottom, mud brick at the top. On the Red Hill were found a large number of, of bone stone heads of spinners, clay iron bundles of waving benches, which testify to the fact that this ancient site was an important textile center. In this con context, it is interesting that the text of one of the clay cuneiform tablets found on the Red Hill mentions the sending of 26 woolen garments, cattle, sheep, and goat skins to the city of Teshevan. Next. The samples we have, there are in this form, they are powder and some textiles, all carbonized. Next. Wool uh, uh, consists of keratin, a sulfur containing protein, which renders the fibers insoluble in acids in cold conditions, but readily dissolvable in heated caustic alkalis. The shape and chemical balance of wool fibers can be modified by various factors. Firstly, exposure to heat and light during the growth of the fleece can produce tippy wool, bleached fiber with narrow tips. Secondly, manufacturing and fi finishing processes, such as the use of alkalis in the cleaning and dyeing of fleece and yam, and fooling may alter the structure of fibers. Thirdly, everyday wear tends to flatten and smooth fibers. Finally, Fungal and bacteria, bacterial attack can alter chemical and physical balance. Bacterial attack causes longitudinal striations leading to the splitting, to splitting and separation of the cortical cells, resulting, resulting in fibers with brush ends. Carbonization. Charred textiles are preserved through Carbonization, which alters the structure of the fibers. Carbonization occurs where textiles are subject to intense heat. The textiles become chemically inert and therefore no longer susceptible to bacterial attack. Textiles subject to carbonization are normal, normally black, stiff, brittle, and extremely fragile. Ryder Walton. They do, however, survive in virtually all archaeological environments. We study the we study the samples with with a microscope or ma uh, or ma. This is treat from sample with a ten ten to magnification visible light. At visible light. This is the textile, always in 10 per one magnification. We used uh, Raman and Serge spectrum. Raman and Serge analysis were performed on a horrible job in even uh, HR evolution micro Raman setup equipped with. Uh, with a 633 nanometer, nanometer laser. A motorized mapping stage was used for inspecting the sample and collecting the Raman signal from specific location on the sample. The standard Raman analysis was 
performed directly on the archaeological samples. Set conditions for the spectra acquisition involved uh, 100 per magnification laser power set at 0 0.38 milliwatt maximum accumulation time of five seconds per scan. Uh, there were 30 scans maximum. This is the spectra before the extraction showed broad signals typical of amorphous carbon at 1335 and uh, 1600 centimeter, which suggests that carbonization process of mineralization. Extraction procedure. All samples were dipped in a mixture of 15% ammonia and one millimole disodium editia. It has been followed a general ratio, one milligram of sample, 0 0.4 milliliter of ammonia and 0 0.4 milliliter disodium editia. The solution of appropriate volume was maintained for 48 hours at room temperature after this period, the yarn was removed and the solution was air flowered in order to remove ammonia, reaching a neutral pH. Then two normal uh, HCl was added to the neutral solution until about pH 4, assessed by litmus test. The extraction of dyes was performed with one pentanol. The extraction was repeated three times. The organic phase was washed with the ionized water three times, controlling the pH to ensure its neutrality. For the search analysis in solution, 200 microliter of silver colloid were inserted in an Eppendorf tube and the uh, 20 microliter of the extract from the sample were added and stirred. Finally, 20 microliter of magnesium sul sulfate sol solution were added and stirred to induce aggregation of the nanoparticles. The final solution was poured in an analytical well on plate and spectra were acquired. Acquired set conditions for the spectra acquisition involved uh, 20 per magnification laser intensity of 1.5 milliwatt maximum accum accumulations time accumulation time of 10 seconds per scan. In order to evaluate eventual spectral interferences deriving from the presence of the extraction solution. Spectra were also collected from a blank prepared by mixing of 200 microliter of silver colloid, 20 microliter of extracting solution subjected to the extraction protocol and 20 microliter of magnesium sulfate solution. Three spectra for every type uh, typology of analyzed solutions, samples and blank were acquired and averaged from a well plate. Average spectrum of the sample was compared with the average one of the blank, blanks in order to discriminate signals attributable to sol solvents or interfering. Spectra difference between the sample spectra and the black, blank one was performed. This is sample one uh, extraction, sample two extraction, and here blank, uh, blank. At one, uh, one, uh, at this, um, uh, at, there is a, this band indicative of the presence of a dye along with a peak of higher intensity at 16, 19, centimeter minus one and uh, 100 um, and and in this uh, at this uh, here okay could be indicative of CA 
COH bending and C, C stretching in anthracinose, which could be present as red yellow dyes. Uh, this is the after extraction difference. And these samples we have CC and CC, C, double C stretching modes that are attributable uh, carotene, carotene, carotenoid dyes, strongly visible in the spectrum difference. This is characteristic spectrum of carotenoids after, after ex extraction. Uh, Verkhovskaya studied, uh, studied uh, Urartian textile from Carmir Blur, and uh, she wrote the principal raw material for textiles in the ancient Near East were sheep, wool, and flax, which was the first material to be used for weaving before the introduction of cotton and silk in antiquity. According to Verkhovskaya, the pieces with patterns had blue, red, and yellow shades. It is possi possible that only the woolen treats, which consisted of a pattern, base, and lines, were preserved from the burnt cloth, and the background of the cloth was made of vegetable linen, sesame, cotton. The archaeological remains, in our case, they were different samples of carbonized textiles from Urar to Karmir Belur. We can deduce that the samples were made of wool and the colors analyzed by sophisticated Raman search spectroscopy reveals peaks attributable to car carotenoid and anthracinone dyes. It was important for museum to know what colors they have used in order to reproduce these colors nowadays. This is the historical and archaeological museum in, in Armenia. Next. The history and the culture of the city were established in 782 BC, visiting the historical and the archaeological museum Erebuni, you can discover the history of Yerevan. The city is 29 years older than Rome. The collection of the Erebuni Museum is rich. You can discover the archaeological artifacts from various regions of Armenia, from pre-Urartian, Urartian, Hellenistic, and even from the early periods. Unique Exhibits are the lapidary inscriptions, including the extensive information about military op operations, culture, and lifestyle in one of the oldest Armenian city, Van, built in 685, 685 BC. There are something, uh, uh, they are, uh, drawing of God Haldi, they, they, how they dress it. Go, uh, there is God Haldi, God Tesheba, and Shuni. Uh, this is after belly. And thank you for attention. And sorry for this <laughs> inconvenience with uh, Zoom. <laughs> it's okay, I guess this. Sometimes happens. We're still all getting used to conferences online. Thank Maybe. you so much for your presentation. Um, does anyone have a question or a comment in the audience? And on YouTube, we still have a small lag. Um, I just would like to say I've never been to Yerevan. I've only seen beautiful pictures because a colleague of mine is from Armenia and she went there to collect um, Cochineo for her I, experiment. Yes, I know her, <laughs> okay. Ermin. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very, and she showed us beautiful, beautiful uh, photos of Vienna. I gave, I gave a, lit, uh, a lot of um, samples to Anna Serrano. The, oh, um, yes. Female, yes. She so, was also from our department, yes. <laughs> yes. So it was really nice to see it again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I don't so- see any questions. Thank you, Yegis, for your time. Now we're going to... Thank you, and sorry for this inconvenience. (laughs) Don't worry, don't worry. (laughs) So now we're going to move on to um, our next speakers, um, Ana Cabrera. Yes, Ana Cabrera La Fuente um, has been a Spanish museum curator since 2001. Her research focuses on textiles, especially those from medieval period on the collecting of textiles and on museum management. She has been the recipient of several international grants and fellowships, including the Marie Curie Fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum. At the present, she's a director of the Spanish Institute of Cultural Heritage and honorary member of the VNA Research Department. She will present uh, her work along with um, Dr. Maria Feliciano and Dr. Borja Franco Lopez. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Um, I will try to share and hope don't have kind of problems. Um, I hope you are looking at my presentation. Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. So many thanks to the organizers to allow us to present our work in progress. And as a, this is a joint paper, as you, as Paula has explained, with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Maria Feliciano and Dr. Borja Franco, and is supported by another cost action, this in this case called Hispan- Islamic Legacy, narrative East, West, South, and North of the Mediterranean in the late medieval period and early modern age. I think it's interesting because we have moved from North Europe to East Europe and now back to the Mediterranean basin and, and in this case, the Iberian Peninsula. So the main aims of this presentation is to stimulate debate because we are working uh, on artworks and we are employed, I think, an imprecise terminology, especially when we are exploring cultural phenomena. And this is important because this used to affect our approach of our historical and mission interpretation. And this is quite a, an important responsibility when the museum curator work labeling the, and classifying the, the artwork at the museum. So my, the, the presentation will have uh, some examples from engravings of the costume books to some representation of the allegories of the continents and also uh, some textiles to try to highlight what we are trying to tackle in this moment. So beginning with the century, 16th century and early 17th century costume books or Trachenbuch in German, sorry, my German is terrible. So would you need to have in mind that from the first quarter of the 16th century till the first quarter of the 17th, Several widely circulated uh, volumes aim to illustrate the ways in which people dress around the known world. And I think this is important because they have plenty of representation that you will see in a moment. What is interesting is that the origins can be traced to the some drawings by the German painter and draw, uh, German Durer, but also some drawings by Christoph Weidich. The volume, the manuscript is all nowadays in the German, Germanist National Museum in Nuremberg and it's an amazing book full of illustration from the travel of Christopher Christoph Weidig to the Iberian Peninsula uh, and has an overview of the different dresses that women, men and children uh, wore in the different kingdoms and regions of the Iberian Peninsula. So what is interesting also 
that we have the first collection of engravings on printed book of costumes were published in the second half of the 16th century, sorry. Among them, two are of the particular interest on the subject that we are dealing today, especially the first one by François de Pré, Requil de la Diversité des Habits, uh, that has around 120 engravings by the Italian uh, Enean Bico. The second example that is really interesting also is by Cesare Vecellio, Abiti Antiqui e Moderni, de Tutto il Mundo. And in the second edition has more than 500 engravings. Uh, that is really interesting. The illustration in this case are detailed and sometimes present from Bantan points, meaning from different point of view. They include male and female attire, of different social classes, from royalty to commoners, as well as varying social ranks and profession, alongside a text detailing garments, and in some cases were to both then or the textiles to uh, um, shape a garment. The books are organized by geographical areas, including kingdom, regions, and cities. In Bechelio's work, the most exhaustive uh, visual representation is offered. And also what is really important is from the point of view of European material. Mm -hmm. From another region of the world, Vicelio should distinguish between Cairo and Africa. And interestingly, they name or label them as Moors, Moros. Indistinctly, similarly, American are separated into Peruvian and Mexican and Asian between Turkish. Syrian, Persian, Tartas, and Indian China, and India and China. For our purpose, the main value of these early volumes, Beidich, Depré, Ambico, Bertelli, Vecellio, is the wider dissemination and their success in providing models that became archetypes. This is something that, for example, Cavallo has already explained in, in her article. And I think that is also Interesting to note that the same pattern uh, emerged as copying the same representation from, in this case, the Granada woman, what in some cases someone described as Moorish, and in the late 19th century they were described as an Oriental. We must ask whether the dresses that illustrate those regions, as for example Granada, or non, and especially those non-European sartorial dresses, non-European dresses, sorry, we must ask whether these dresses that illustrate the region are real or imaginary. We presume that European models are accurate representation or product of first-hand observation. But what about the others? I think this is an important point because could explain how some models were more uh, copy than others, especially the non-Europeans. For exotic location, we must take into account that sources that provide the author's models. In Bechelio's case, as a Venetian, has a first-hand insight in the Italian models, but also from East Mediterranean models, being Venetia one of the most important commercial hubs of Europe at this moment. But Petelio knowledge, I think, is something that we need to have in mind. Mm -hmm. So going ahead, we have that the early costume books offer insight into the depth of the 16th century cross-cultural knowledge from the European perspective. And this is thing, something that we need to have in mind. They copy and repeated models that aided in the construction of identities and the circulation of stereotypes of non-Europeans. As Riello points out, the overlap between individual figures, dress, and the locality, place, that costume books present a confirmed through repetition. The topographical specificity becomes a recurrent theme of course or convention of representation that through repetition emerge the stereotype. And I think this is the most important uh, role of this costume book because these costume books are, go, are going to be repeated and are going to be used by artists, are going to be seen in a moment. In fact, their taxonomic organization avoid the use of non-geographical terms, and this is quite important. The costume books 
of the second half of the 16th century saw broad representation of cloth and clothing from Near East and fewer depictions from Asia, India, China, and Japan. On the other hand, the concept of Oriental and Orientalism is not present in these books because following Adam Jesse, Orientalism begins with a deliberate, qualitative, and self conscious separation between cultures. A mentality that maybe the, the, these early costume dogs have uh, from another perspective, meaning the geographical perspective. So having this in mind, we move to the model used in, in engraving that describe continents. And also the models that were used to the event of festivity, to the arrival of the kings and court, to the cities, to different cities. And I have here this example because we can see how different is the representation from North and Southern European countries until the seventh century. As Franco suggests, the image of the four continents allow us to analyze the peculiarity of the Iberian case. In the Low Countries and 17th century Italy, a stereotype representation developed in which sartorial representation carry little semantic weight. And I think you have here in this representation of Asia by the Adrian Collaret following a drawing by Martin de Boss. The Iberian tradition, on the other hand, was unique in portraying the continents dressed in either Morisco style and Turkish style, and the continents that are representing are those of Asia and Africa. Thus, Africa and Asia were usually represented wearing similar outfits, since their inhabitants were or were assuming to be Muslim. The only visible differences were the Turkish weapons, which traditionally, traditionally surround the female figure representing Asia. And the amount of detail in the description of the precious jewels that she wore. I think this is very important because in this engraving of the continents, but also in those drawing of the, uh, for example, um, uh, ephemeral construction to celebrate the, the arrival of the kings in the cities, you have a fully account on the Brighton sources. And this is when you can see how different are the are the representation from the low countries to the Iberian perspective. So since East and West were depicted wearing identical dress, the differences between then rely on the non of external cultural elements, meaning the weapons, the jewelry, maybe the headdress, etc. This particularity escapes the iconographic ties found in the costume books and so how the image of the East began to take shape in order to make it understandable and visible to the local Iberian population. In festivity context, the Orient was very much in a construct. Images of the East resort to the very specific items that have little or nothing to do with the Spanish material culture, such as the Turkish armament, for example, headgear or staff, but more specifically to the Muslim culture in general. What result is a kind of specific otherness, more related to objects than people. And I think this is an interesting point because now we move that lead us to question the alleged Orientalism of medieval and early modern sartorial display in Iberia. As discussed, we must contend with the disassociation between the way in which Asia was perceived and described by travelers, conqueror, and how was represented in public celebration. Visual propaganda attempt to create a comprehensible image of the Muslim ASEAN, which was not rooted in reality. And Feliciano brought an excellent example in this. Um, in this, uh, well, <clears throat> a sculpture or relief of St. James the Moor as lawyer. This is from a church in San Xavier de Moxos in the nowadays Bolivia and is dated in the 18th century. What is interesting is that in the 18th century depiction of St. James the Moor as lawyer, uh, we have a conventional depiction of a large scale Santiago on an enormous white horse this is very important, from hoops trampled over infidels. And the infidels that are here, that are not moves, not Islamic people, by Chinese from the Qing dynasty. 
And I think this is an excellent example that they are safe and that this specific of the narrative and the use of Chinese men as representation of heterodoxy was only reduced to the blanket statement of Morris in modern scholarship. This is quite interesting because the Moors, those Islamic people has changed to Chinese one because they are the others that are completely different from the European or Bifurrain perspective. So we have seen what important of these costume books uh, have provided of prototype for this representation, but what happened with the textiles? And I think this is an, another completely different point because on the case of the textiles, what we see is that meanwhile, in the early medieval period and medieval and early medieval periods, uh, they were well known by the quality and provenance after the beginning of the textile collecting and early museum, what we have is that they try to put the textiles uh, under different labels or terms of classifiers. And I think what is really interesting is when we, when we examine this through time and, prob and obviously from different perspectives, we can see that this has quite a different argument. What is more important is that these early museums and textile on this museum were classified following, for example, the different trends as the Orientalism, the envelope of the disciplines also play a role because at the early 19th century, the discipline of history of art of Islamic, Islamic art were completely under down, uh, but also the use of terms from medieval writing sources. So we are going to take an, a little example from the VNA extant and white textile collecting. Here you have French, German, hispano moresque Italian, Levantine, Moorish, Near East, North African, Oriental, Saracenic, Sicilian, and Spanish. All these terms were applied to textiles from the medieval and early modern period that were from Spain or possibly or LNG saved from Spain. What is interesting is that for example, many terms coined in this late 19th century and early 20th century uh, were more ample or hard, have more terms from for those textiles that are from Mediterranean basin and they don't know exactly they are European or not. So we have Saracenic, hispano mores or Sicilian terms that were coined to try to explain those textiles that have a combination or even have Islamic motifs, but also have some that they don't cannot be described as a Islamic motif. What is really interesting is that following from the mid 19th century to mid 20th century, these textiles has been changed through time their classification. And you have here an example of this Saracenic silk that was acquired in 1892 and currently at the VNA database is classified as Italian 14th century. But also a point that needs to be done is that sometimes the same textile is classified chronologically and stylistically differently depending on the collection that this textile is. So, and this is a problem because sometimes we are working with textiles that have different fragments in different collection and they cannot be connected because are completely different described or even have different chronology. And this is a key point when we are talking about trying to have a more uh, wide view of the textiles on, on museum. And here you have uh, a really nice example that this on the black and white, you have a nice example of this Saracenic textiles according to the 1894 classification that uh, was classified as Spanish after my Marie Curie uh, view, my, my Marie Curie fellow, but we cannot be sure. And you have an example of the Copper, Cooper Hewitt new collection that this textile was classified classify as Spanish from the beginning because there was a, a, a collection from a Spanish collector. In short, what we are going, what we would like to explore is the variety of perception of Islamic material from culture and sartorial practice. And I think what is important is to 
have in account that the anachronistic terms such orient, oriental Moorish, hispano mores are not helpful in the study of the Iberian Peninsula material culture. Instead, what we want is advocate for a context, a specific methodologies and critical readings of documentary and visual uh, evidence. And I think this is what really important talking on museum artwork. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, it was really interesting to see how the same type of textiles can be uh, categorized very differently. Um, I have just one small question, which might not have an answer. What is your suggestion in terms of uh, when we see these um, miscategorizations in museums, what, what is the take that we should? Uh, I think that um, at present, what we need to know to have is as much as possible material online to allow us to see uh, if we have uh, similar material or we have completely different material. So what I have done during my two years of at the VNA is try to connect those, those textiles that I have access, not only from the VNA but also from the American collection, the, the Vienna. Uh, Mac Museum and other museums. So I think that it's, it's really useful to have access through online catalogs or through the collection directly and put together. And afterwards, I don't say that all these material are from Iberia or Spanish. What I'm saying is that we need to put head together and try to find a common terminology because maybe we need to avoid this kind of cultural levels of geographical levels and maybe go to another one. The most important thing is that maybe knowing how uh, the Italian uh, textile industry was connected to the French and to the uh, Spanish or even to the Germ German, they have a common technological ground. This is sometimes very difficult to find the differences. So maybe we need to have a European, Mediterranean, I don't know. I mean, this is an open question for us or, already. But what we need to have in mind that sometimes this, this scale of terms are a blanket that do not allow to see what the, the, the textile or the dress really mean. I, I like that sentence. <laughs> the blanket that kind of hides. Well, it's Felicianos, the... Maria Felicianos. <laughs> I like that sentence. <laughs> So are there any questions or comments? No, and not on YouTube as well. Oh, Magda, yes. I mean, yeah, just very quick if I can, but I think we, we have uh, just a few minutes left for discussion. Uh, it was more a comment than a question than uh, because I, on, I mean, uh, I work on a completely different material, but it's uh, like, yeah, it's it's a challenging uh, dossier, if I may say, because because those textiles were acquired in different contexts, and sometimes we are missing them, and so it's a uh, yeah, it's really long quest sometimes to piece the things together, and uh, yeah, and also like from depending on the level of publication, you also sometimes lack very technical uh, descriptions, yes. So hopefully if they are like reanalyzed in more recent, uh, in forthcoming years, it's, it could also help to, to make a wider picture of it. But yeah, just, just this comment that, yeah. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Very inspiring, up, up, up. inspiring <laughs> presentation. I'm mixing all languages, sorry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> what is really interesting also is that when I see the examples that the people ha is, com is, is presenting in this conference, that really congratulations for the organization. I think that maybe, for example, the veil that we have been seeing in the, in, the, in the presentation, in the first presentation, I think if you go to this costume book, you will have plenty of examples of veil women in Europe, through Europe, in the 16th and 17th century. And, and also it's really interesting because this kind of costumes or dresses has been in sometimes can be fossilized in some areas, for example, the Basque County in the Iberian case, or uh, in the Valencian uh, country that is an 18th century 
uh, dress, for example. I think that is really important to keep and study this kind of dresses because give you not only an overview of the 19th century costumes, but also give you an overview of maybe early costumes dress in these countries. Yeah, I just also wanted to add, I put that in my notes, that it's really this uh, Trachtenberg phenomenon is something really interesting also in terms of like why the studies about how ethnography started, yes? Yeah. And, and it's interesting that like the, the, the thing they wanted to, to illustrate that was more like visually appealing was exactly the clothing, yes? Yeah? So it's like something for us also, some, some food mm -hmm. for thought for, for later, uh, yeah, <laughs> work. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, okay, so now we move on to our next um, and final presenter of the morning, Roxana. <laughs> so Roxana is a postdoc fellow at the Orient Institute in Istanbul. She studied art history and Romanian modern history at the University of Bucharest, Bucharest uh, with a PhD in history. Her research interests covers broad and interconnected spectrum of topics ranging from the history of Romanian collections and nationalism, cultural history of emotions, oriental representations in Roman, Romanian modern art, Ottoman material culture of the two former provinces of Wallachia and Moldavia to Ottoman residential architecture. Exploring in her PhD the various narratives of representations on what was constructed as oriental versus Romanian during the 19th century, by using a diversity of sources, she continued to research the dynamic between the presence of Ottoman material culture in Wallachia and Moldavia and the national state of Romania strategies to deal with its Ottoman legacy. Roxana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paola, for this very nice introduction. And thank you for the uh, to the organizer to have such a I don't know, fruitful and rich conference. I mean, uh, I listened to some really amazing presentations so far, and I'm really glad that I'm uh, after Ana Cabrera La Fuente because I feel like between our research, uh, there are a few connections, especially dealing with Orientalism and Oriental labels like this. Uh, and today I'm going to speak about the fascinating character, honestly. Uh, and the more I read about him and also uh, his work, the more I discover that he's such a, I don't know, delightfully paradoxical type of individual. And uh, uh, he also deals with uh, or the Orient and Orientalism and uh, and I don't know, uh, um, negotiating between um, different identities. So uh, I'm going to speak, uh, be speaking about Marco Beza, a uh, Romanian collector from the uh, 1930s, who also served as the uh, Romanian general consul to Jerusalem between 1931 and 1939 during the British mandate of uh, Jerusalem, or rather interesting period in the, in the city's history. But before I delve into his collection and who he was and what he did and what he collected and most specifically the textiles in his collection, I would like to speak about uh, 1930s in Romania uh, because it's a very interesting period in my country, in my country's history. We are just after the uh, First World War and uh, we just gained some new territories. So the territory of uh, the national state of Romania has been expanded to include some other uh, provinces that came uh, with some new ethnic minorities included in the package. Uh, and uh, therefore, the one of the solutions to deal with this very diverse national state, new national state, say, to uh, put it like this, was to revisit the country's main legal document, which is which was of course the constitution. And the the constitution is quite quite evident in the in how Romania want, uh, Romania wanted to deal with a multi ethnic state because it said that the Romanian kingdom is a national unitary indivisible state. There are no mentions of, of uh, I don't know ethnic minorities or the right to have uh, I don't know 
rights and freedoms as a minority. So everything must have must have been Romanian, irregardless of the fact that you are Jewish, Hungarian, and so on and so forth. And in this particular context, we have a Romanian historian by the name of Nicolae Iorga, who kind of um, uh, becomes a catalyst to the creation of uh, Byzantine science studies as a research field. And he has this very interesting idea regarding uh, Byzantium and the history of the Byzantine Empire and the relation with the Ottoman conquest, stating that uh, even after the conquest and fall of the Byzantine Empire, uh, the Byzantine legacy kind of uh, continued and survives in, even under the Ottoman Empire, because Byzantium was an idea, was an uh, assemblage of um, uh, practices and conventions and political uh, theories, and it was an idea. It wasn't like this concrete form of State, but more of an idea, and therefore ideas can survive disasters, e.g. the fall of Constantinople in 1453. And on top of this uh, amalgam of nationalism, continuity of the Byzantine legacy in the form of, I don't know, uh, Romania as a successor of the Byzantine Empire, we have a very interesting uh, art phenomenon. Uh, with the creation of the Baltic Art School. Uh, Baltic is a, kind of, is a city nowadays in Bulgaria on the Black Sea seaside. It's a very beautiful and picturesque type of city that uh, during the interwar period in Romania kind of became associated like this Orient, but not completely Orient, or more like a close Orient that's ours, but not completely ours in this kind of interesting play on identities and uh, geographical uh, imagination. And you have this plethora of Romanian artists who go to Baltic and start painting various uh, scenes that when you look at them, you just see the garden variety orientalist type of approach with uh, scenes representing Turkish and Tartar population, coffee shops, scorching sun, vivid colors, things like these. So uh, about now uh, going into who was Marco Beza. Well, there's a very interesting connection between him and the uh, Romanian historian that I mentioned, Nicolae Iorga, uh, meaning that uh, Marco Beza kind of um, worked with and presented his um, the findings of his travels and the uh, collections to uh, Nicolae Iorga. And Nicolae Iorga made a point of uh, uh, speaking in front of the Romanian Academy about Marco Beza's work and findings. And you have a nice quote here about Marco Beza from Nicolae Iorga, uh, when, where he calls him a tireless treasure seeker of Romanian history and our treasure in the Orient. So for uh, Nicola Iorga, Jerusalem and the uh, Asia Minor was, of course, the Orient. And uh, the fact that uh, Marco Beza made a point of also uh, searching for Romanian traces in the ancient Near East uh, made it even more interesting. Um, now, uh, I have used this uh, particular portrait of Marco Beza uh, that was painted by a uh, Romanian artist, uh, Rodi Cavanio. She's a very interesting Romanian artist. To give you a bit of insight into how he perceived in himself as this uh, oriental kind of cultural play because we think him uh, dressed in a Palestinian type of uh, overcoat. It's a traditional uh, overcoat that's being used in uh, specific festive occasions. We see him sat down on a sofa type of structure uh, that's covered with types of textiles that are, are not very well defined in terms of uh, decoration and material, but we can assume that they kind of go into the whole Orient type of uh, imagery. But who was Marco Beza, after all? 
He's a very uh, interesting character, as I said, because uh, first of all, he was Armenian, therefore a member of a, a very interesting ethnic group that uh, that's kind of spread across the uh, the Balkans and the uh, European um, part of the Ottoman Empire. He was born in Salonika. He uh, took courses in uh, both letters and philosophy with a very uh, conservative intellectual uh, by the name of Tito Maiorescu. He also started to have like this research type of activity and pub intense publishing activity after he went to London. London. He started uh, translating various uh, Romanian works and uh, Romanian stories and also books about uh, Romanian pan uh, paganism and religion. Uh, he traveled extensively because his job as a diplomat kind of allowed him to and also provided the financial resources to do so. And although he was a diplomat by occupation, he was a researcher by vocation. Uh, as I was reading uh, the correspondence between him and his wife, uh, the general feeling is that he kind of hated his job as a diplomat, loved the glamour of it, like parties and dinners uh, and so on, but the official visit and inaugurating various monuments and uh, the diplomatic part of the activity, he kind of hated that, he preferred to travel and uh, visit, visit different cities and go to shops and buy things that he would later on either collect them and uh, store them in his uh, Jerusalem apartment at the Romanian consulate or send, him, send the objects to his, to his wife. He published extensively, and that's kind of an understatement because he not only published books in terms like uh, uh, papers on Romania and uh, Romanian folklore, or English travels to Romania, or uh, books that uh, emphasize the Byzantine heritage because he was heavily influenced by Nikolai Yorga's theories about Byzantine, uh, Byzantine co continuity and so on. But he also published uh, travel logs about his own travels, like this one uh, uh, on the, the Holy Lands, who is basically uh, a story of his travels to the ancient uh, to Asia Minor, but the most interesting part of his publications are the articles that he published in a Romanian periodical by the name of Bobe de Gru, because the titles of these uh, articles are uh, emphasizing the fact that he was basically going to uh, Athos to Mount Sinai to uh, the monastery, the monastery and of Saint Sava to Epirus to Istanbul to search for Romanian traces, and he found found them. Quite he found quite a few of them. He managed to identify various body paintings of uh, in Romanian Middle Ages uh, rulers. He found manuscripts. He found textiles. He found icons. Uh, that not only he uh, kind of documented in a very uh, efficient manner with pictures and uh, historical descriptions of what he found, but he mostly published them in this series of articles. And for that, uh, he was kind of greatly appreciated by Nikolai Yorga as well. Now, his collection is, yeah, it's quite impressive. <laughs> I now, I now come to the good part, to the very visually impressive part. Uh, his collection is uh, nowadays uh, hosted in the Mu Museum of Art Collections in Bucharest, which is part of the National Museum of Art of Romania. Uh, this is uh, one of the two rooms in which the collection is hosted. Uh, this is what it's well, generally and nowadays called the Arab Room, because uh, the interesting part of uh, Marco Beza's collection is that uh, the majority of it was uh, exhibited and, um, uh, I don't know, placed in, the, in his apartment in Jerusalem with the Romanian consulate. And I am 
still researching that. It's pretty much a work in progress. But another significant part was made up of from the objects that he uh, always sent his wife. He had a very intensive correspondence with, uh, with his wife. He always sent her various uh, small gifts comprising of um, jewels, textiles, mostly, but also fruits and dinosaur branches of all uh, uh, olive trees or lavender and so on. Uh, as you can see from this very interesting assemblage uh, that is the Arrow Group in nowadays the uh, Museum of Art Collections in Romania, that there is a significant percentage of textiles in his collections, mainly carpets from what you can see. And uh, you also have this uh, Palestine, uh, Palestinian Malak dress. You also have pillows that were made from Kilim. Uh, and there are a few other a few other examples, uh, not in uh, not in on the plate right now, but I will get to them uh, as soon as possible. Why do I see Marco Beza as a form of I don't know kind of Orientalist approach? Uh, and uh, I chose this particular quote from one of his travel logs to to show you how. His perception is more of a uh, kind of a garden variety type of Orientalist perception. From the description of Jerusalem, because the quote is uh, uh, the first description of the city of Jerusalem as he sees it uh, the first time that he uh, gets there. You can see the, the disappointment at how, uh, at how the city looks like. He uh, emphasizes the fact that the uh, buildings are not impressive, just yellow gray buildings with red, uh, red brick uh, bricks. There's a general atmosphere of dryness. Um, uh, it's, and he actually begins the quote, the city meant nothing to me. I mean, he's totally unimpressed, but as he progresses towards the end of the quote, He's like, um, for, he starts talking about unforgettable memories, the bustle of the streets, the colorful, the shade of the bazaars, like the, all these uh, usual oriental tropes about uh, Jerusalem. And not only that, but he kind of uh, associates uh, uh, the Jewish people with words such as, I don't know, primitive. And uh, he does speak about the fact that the, the, the city of Jerusalem was blessed by God, but unfortunately, given the fact that the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians were disputing the city, he, com he kind of lamented on the fact, on the uh, faith of the city, and uh, uh, also starts to uh, go into this oral legend and fact type of approach when he describes the cities and uh, uh, the places that, uh, that he visits. But uh, the very interesting fact about this, uh, this book on, uh, on Holy Lands that was translated into English uh, under the title on Holy Lands is that textile states uh, uh, are placed on, uh, with a greater emphasis. He talks about various textiles that uh, belong to the various and make the minorities living in Jerusalem. He speaks about uh, adornments. He speaks about uh, bod uh, bodily alterations according to various ethnic or uh, religious uh, customs. And he also speaks about textiles when he uh, attends various religious services, especially the ones that were held at the uh, Holy Sepulchre. Um, and also uh, about the connections between textiles and the city and how textiles kind of represent the identity of the city. Uh, the book is also um, illustrated with various photographs that were taken by a Jewish uh, photographer who emigrated from Austria-Hungaria to Jerusalem after the First World War. And among those photographs are uh, various depictions of um, the mostly the Arab and Bedouin type of populations who were who were uh, pretty present in Jerusalem at that moment. 
Textiles also uh, appear in the in jewelry and adornments, appear in the correspondence, intense correspondence between him and his wife. I chose a few uh, paragraphs to illustrate that. He speaks about Egyptian powder boxes, bed, uh, Bedouin uh, bracelets and Bedouin necklaces. He speaks about laces and embroideries. And also a uh, very interesting uh, uh, thing about how he, um, I don't know, perceives this type of jewelry and textiles in relation to his wife. You can see here in the second quote about uh, the uh, big bracelets that were for the upper arm and that these bracelets have inside them some, I don't know, pebbles or, or smaller pieces of metal that make a sound when the, the wearer uh, is walking. And uh, when referring to the, uh, I don't know, uh, possibility of his wife wearing those uh, particular bracelet, bracelets, he uses, you will make a sound like an oriental daughter that you are. Athena, his wife, being actually of Armenian uh, origin, just as him, he was. So <laughs> uh, he also uh, took a, took a uh, official photographic portrait of himself dressed in um, uh, Arab Palestinian textiles, uh, which he later uh, made into a postcard. And uh, he sent both the photograph and the postcard to his wife. And he uh, he uh, wrote in the letter uh, joining the the postcard and the photograph. Uh, uh, Here is your sheikh who will love you under the scorching sun of the desert in a Bedouin tent. Yeah, he was very descriptive in his love for his wife. Uh, you can see in the following letters he speaks about uh, shawls from Damascus. Uh, he mentions the mosaics from the uh, Umayyad Mosque. Uh, Palestinian textiles, um, sketches with uh, local costumes. And again, and a very interesting uh, 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 impact and I don't know, situation that I found in this 1934 uh, letter to his wife. Um, he uh, asks about a Palestinian coat or dress that he sent to his wife and not only uh, asks about whether she likes it or not, but he kind of gives some sartorial advice about, about how to wear it, that it would go well to one of his wife's white pleated dresses. And I found that so interesting and amusing at the same time. And now uh, to kind of conclude my presentation and not, not keep you away from uh, lunch break, I wanted to show you a few examples uh, exhibited today in the, uh, in the collection. Uh, these are two very interesting chapons uh, made from a Persian type of style of uh, embroidered for card. And the interesting part of it is that, uh, I don't know how uh, well you can see that they have an ikat type of uh, woolen ikat uh, double lining. And the ikat is cotton, it's not silk. And uh, for, uh, I don't know, kind of joining them, you have a 20th century Suzani type of uh, table cover. You have a Bethlehem Paxire, uh, a short jacket. Uh, you have a fragment, this very interesting fragment of a Syrian abaya. And then again, a uh, close up of the Palestinian Malak dress. I haven't yet uh, attributed to uh, more ac accurate geographical area because these type of dresses are more, uh, are very. Uh, varying depending on the area of Palestine that you are, that these textiles are coming from. And also close up of the various uh, pillows that were made from kilims that are kind of part of the, uh, the arrow room. And that was about uh, uh, Marco Beza. This is pretty much uh, research in progress.
And the more I uh, go down the rabbit hole of what is currently the Mark of Beza collection, the more I kind of go uh, get more and more excited and have more and more questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Roxanne. I really enjoyed your very romantic presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really liked the, his letters to his wife. They're really beautiful, actually. Yeah, they are. So does anyone have um, any questions to Roxana or comments? Yes, Anna, go ahead. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> First out of all, so Roxana, thank you very much for the presentation. And I think it's really interesting to see that the Orientalism is another blanket that go from Eastern Europe to the Americas. And I think the, the Arab room that you have so us has plenty of examples in, in private collection. Even I think in just in Spain, but also in France and, and, and England, in British Iceland, for example. I'm really impressed because it's quite interesting to make a comparison between the sources. Because meanwhile, in your case, you look through Near East, the French and the Spaniards and sometimes the Italians look more for the North African references. Mm -hmm. So, and you have this kind of, maybe the nearest source is the most interesting one. So I'm thinking that also is, is interesting to see if there was this kind of relation with another collectors or another intellectuals from Europe that has the same interest in the in this kind of things and oriental near east um, near east uh, culture yeah um, because this is pretty much uh, uh, research in progress and it also relates to the uh, project that I'm doing here at the Orient Institute because uh, I'm starting to look at the uh, collectors in Romania uh, beginning with the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century and the presence of uh, Ottoman or Islamic material culture and how that kind of uh, relates to our own process of dealing with the uh, Ottoman Oriental legacy in our history because as part of the Ottoman Empire the, there's a significant uh, amount of Ottoman and Islamic material culture that was present as uh, as a result of us being part of the Ottoman Empire. And to see this, uh, this interest in uh, Ottoman and Islamic material culture in terms of collecting, it's pretty interesting because it also goes into how we kind of perceived ourselves in, in terms and in context with the, uh, with the Ottoman Empire, when, and with the Near East, because for us, uh, and I think the uh, it's a similar case with Spain as well. Um, the Orient was pretty much part of who we were and part of our history, and to uh, kind of uh, tra transform it into something to collect and to appraise for I don't know aesthetic qualities, because mm -hmm. there's there's a significant amount of aesthetic appraisal of these objects kind of makes you wonder why uh, does it mean is like a uh, byproduct of the westernization that uh, came uh, happened in the 19th century uh, is is it a way of saying uh, that we're not actually oriental but, but we're western like the french or the english would took an interest in the uh, the north uh, the northern part of the african continent in terms of east or oriental and as i said for beza it's kind of a negotiation because he's a, he's interested in the near east for its oriental qualities for its islamic culture but also as um as a way to search for romanian traces because whenever he went to uh, jerusalem to nazareth to sidon he kind of uh started uh, to look for what was actually Romanian in Asia Minor, if there are any traces, and uh, what that kind of meant 
for him as a researcher and for Romania at that particular moment in time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rotana. Um, are there any more comments or questions? I don't think there's anything on YouTube. Okay. Thank you so much, Roxana, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for having me. And now uh, let's all go to lunch. <laughs> and we'll meet here at 2.30. Uh, yeah. Have a nice See lunch. You soon.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Let's start um, our final session of uh, the day. So uh, Tim Perry Williams uh, is trained in woven textiles in England and Japan, where holistic craft-based education has informed and driven a portfolio of practice encompassing research, writing, consultancy, curation, education, and both artisanal and industrial textile making. Tim is currently a professor of arts, textiles at the University of Bergen, Norway. His recent projects have addressed material provenance and textile making and use, particularly in the domestic context. Academic concerns have been around cross-situational production practices, inherited knowledge systems and crafts, identity and material culture and design in historical textiles. In particular, over 20 years experience with Japan brings an extensive knowledge of Japanese textile crafts and industry. Tim, the floor is yours. Good afternoon from Bergen. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I've, I've, only, I've been pulled in many directions and I've um, missed a lot of the live sessions, but I've been dipping into the YouTube. So thank you so much for doing that. It's a wonderful resource. Okay, now let me see if I can share my screen successfully. Oh, what's going on? Uh, isn't it always the way? <laughs> One second. I had that ready. Excuse me one minute. I'm having a major technical issue. Our, Not a problem. Uh, we have our PowerPoint runs off uh, cloud three, six, five. And <laughs> I've been using this the last period and uh, it's now telling me the service is unavailable. I do have a PDF backup, but I'd really rather use the PowerPoint if I can. Okay, something's there now, let's see. Right, hopefully you see a full screen now. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, uh, my apologies for the tech. <laughs> Off we go. Uh, I'm going to um, unapolog unapologetically drown you in images and objects. Hopefully that's welcome uh, after your, your lunch, your stupor. Okay, um, this is me, I'm a weaver. I am in this forum, I'm the cuckoo in the nest. I am not uh, an archeologist, a scientist, a historian, a conservator, all those things. And what I'm going to share with you is how I view these objects as primarily as a weaver. My own work is many and varied. I do all of these things that you've kindly uh, mentioned uh, and projects are in, in hand weaving and industrial weaving, uh, hand uh, towels in uh, linen here, uh, looking at the concept of too nice to use, fashion fabrics from a mill context, um, applied arts pieces using uh, traditional um, ECAP techniques learned in Japan, and very, very recently indeed, uh, this is a sample of a, a work in progress, um, working with uh, Damas to explore more culturally um, critical aesthetic of work coming up. But Japan is a very important part of my, of my training and my, my practice, my ongoing research interests. And uh, I, I did my master's in 96, 97 in Okinawa down here in the south. I hope you see the cursor. And uh, there I learned vernacular plant fiber uh, traditions in banana fiber and um, rami, to use the Western term, production. Um, from 2003 onwards, I've had a sustained uh, research practice back and forth, um, working many ways. And uh, in 2003, I started a research project with this uh, great friend of mine who is also um, a, a non-professional researcher. She's a kimono weaver. And we started looking at um, museum objects um, specifically. And the project Plain Stripe Check 
important context for what I want to share with you. Uh, textiles, woven textiles is a very rich uh, field and there are many things we might have looked at. And um, these kind of things I was seeing when I was a student in Okinawa are these wonderful, rich, uh, beautiful, exotic uh, objects full of complex pattern and color. And these are the things that we find easily in museum collections. I believe this is to do with the fact that there's a hierarchy of collecting around the exceptional, the, the, the extraordinary, technically produced, etc. And often these things represent, um, uh, example, uh, social status, etc. So these are the things that are preserved. This is a, a industry uh, sample book from a, a, a British mill horribly uh, preserved, the curators would be mortified by the glue, but they're these very complex things. And we wanted to not look at these, we wanted to look at the things that predate um, this kind of technology uh, facilitated um, production. Uh, and we've, we've essentially focused on textiles from between around 1600 and, and 1850, um, which uh, ensures a reasonable sufficiency of comparable um, artifacts but again, importantly, represents this pre-industrial um, development. And we had a set of objectives, which you see here. And we looked at things like these, uh, where, do, where, do we, where are we going to start? Uh, here we've got uh, mosquito nets in, in, um, in Hemp and uh, remnants, co cotton cloth remnants, patch stitched, mended, all sorts of objects uh, from the museum collections and higher objects, perhaps these where, where um, uh, authenticity is more associated with the sort of complete objects, often with uh, very full uh, records. Uh, but uh, we increasingly moved in, in the direction of, of uh, sample books um, as they represent uh, layers of uh, inherited knowledge um, and, and carry a different cultural value. Um, there's some British examples here just to show the range of the research uh, we were doing. Um, this yeah, gives us a, a perspective over the widest possible range of, of definable textile cultures within the cultures. Um, so we did shift to these two books, which when you read together, allow you to um, see a broad vocabulary of design traditions. There's a close up of one of these pages. Um, so these sample books are assemblages of, of other wholes. They're gathered and ordered for various purposes. Uh, but always to demonstrate the chief characteristics of the cloth uh, cultures they represent. Um, so the, for here, example, uh, this is, these are Welsh cloths and here's a close up. And then we, we relate to the, the actual context, which is clothing. Here's a, here's a skirt from that tradition and aprons and the whole ensemble. So again, this, is, this was an Anglo-Japanese uh, project uh, originally. And we got to the stage when we started to be able to compare uh, textiles uh, here is a, it's a coincidence really but it's an example of where you can start to uh, find comparable models in uh, in this case Anglo-Japanese context could have been much further and we started to make new work uh, in a response to the research and present them in a series of exhibitions which included increasingly as you see on the left here uh, examples of the various um, objects we were looking at in the museums where the exhibitions were being housed. So this is some British exhibitions. And the last exhibition iteration was in 2013 uh, in Austria. And this is a reminder again uh, of this complexity of um, uh, artifacts we were, we were researching. And in the background, you see again, uh, sample books. So going back to Japan, Apologies, some of these images are um, a little warped and I wasn't able to adjust them. Um, a great proportion uh, of historical pattern books have chiefly survived uh, because they, um, they originally and continue to contain commercial and economic value. And this is one reason why they, they were preserved uh, locally and later um, collected for um, the importance of understanding what, what has gone before. And here is an example of a method I've used um, a, a digital uh, deconstruction and reconstruction of pages of a bound um, trade pattern book from Hachijo, which is uh, to the west of, of Tokyo, out in the, in the Pacific, uh, which allows us to compare um, within the framework of the genre we're looking at. Here, these cloths are all made from two colours only. And uh, it's an extraordinary diversity, even though we're just looking at um, stripes and checks. Uh, the I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can. 
this uh, particular book it gives us extraordinary um, detail on the the coloring, uh, the numbers of threads, density, all sorts of information because these were a way of regulating the production of the cloths from this region. And we're coming closer to the main share here. Uh, this is Echigo Jofu. And uh, Echigo um, is, I'll come to a map in a moment, but uh, often um, Echigo cloths uh, contain um, uh, kasuri or ikat um, so, uh, and sophisticated uh, stripes and checks. This is, uh, this is early, um, this is 17th, um, it's, there's a very wide field, <laughs> 17th and 19th century is a very wide bracket. Um, this is uh, earlier um, in the, the frame of the objects I've been looking at. Um, uh, this is an example of some things out of um, a kind of expected uh, colour uh, palette. But uh, Echigo and uh, Chijimi, which I'll come on to, are woven from fine spliced uh, twisted thread made from uh, choma in, in, in Japanese, which is... Um, in often referred to in slang terms as China grass or in commercial terms as rami. It's a cousin of uh, nettle. Um, and in the Echigo tradition, um, the fiber um, has been raised, uh, produced in, uh, in the adjacent uh, geography in, in Japan and coming to a map um, for centuries. And so this uh, genre within Japanese textile dramas actually represents um, a sophisticated culture of trade and making over, over many, many generations. So here's a map uh, of the central part of Japan. So uh, what I'm uh, sharing with you mainly is on this region, uh, Niigata, and uh, this uh, material trade culture was with, with uh, neighbouring uh, Fukushima. And a lot of you will know of Fukushima because of the, the tragic events of 2013. Uh, but the region, um, uh, many regions in central Japan, very agriculture, has been supplying uh, the West Coast with uh, plant fibers, plant fiber textiles for hundreds of years. Uh, again, images aren't brilliant here. I apologize. There's some better ones coming. Uh, so this is a, again, this is a horizontal analysis from um, a trade book. Um, I've actually anonymized um, a lot of the collection objects because I don't have copyright to, to uh, share these things in the public domain from the Japanese museum. So some of it is anonymized. Uh, but this is um, these are thumbnails, if you like, from the um, from key objects um, in uh, one of the Tokyo museums, um, and we see uh, in. Let me go a bit closer. We see in these uh, various small cuttings um, a number of um, traditions uh, represented emerging. So here, um, this is a a dark um, cloth, which is again more unusual but a simple uh, stripe, ground uh, and pattern. Uh, here's a slightly dark image, um, another stripe um, playing with, with, with uh, spacing. And then here we have some, some checks. So uh, constructions of checks using uh, the relationship between ground and pattern. And the middle one we see, for example, um, a, a layering of checks, a latticing. So we've got one check that's made up of uh, pairs of walks and wefts and then uh, which is framing a single uh, warp and weft. And this is very common, this uh, subtle uh, variation. And um, here are examples of what Japanese call kuzushi, uh, which in weaving languages, color and weave, where patterns are created with sequences of darks and lights. Um, uh, on, this, on the right-hand side, uh, we see an example of a two and two color and weave hairline check uh, which with such a fine yarn count, and I'm coming to that, almost reads as plain. And that is important. These things uh, are patterned, but at a distance appear flat. And that is a key part of the aesthetic we are going to arrive at. Uh, here's another example where um, uh, the design is uh, incorporating a number of, of uh, elements within, within the one. And here's a, a quite a complex check. Um, using um, darks and lights and uh, actually three, three colors, which is, uh, again, more unusual. Uh, so what's the context of these? Well, here is a, a print of a Kabuki uh, theatre. And why am I showing you Kabuki theatre? Because it is a very um, wonderful uh, way of seeing immediately a kind of literal and perceived um, class or uh, you know, how one appears 
amongst a group of other people in in society. And uh, kabuki is famously uh, often compared to uh, equivalents in other parts of the world. For example, um, Shakespeare theatre culture in my home country in England, where uh, being at the theatre was a place to be seen, a place to be known, and and what you choose to wear is extremely important. So kimono culture. As, as many of you will know, is a complex assemblage and layering of gowns, tying sashes, cords, binding cords, and accessories. It's highly refined and coded vocabulary with a hierarchy of material, patterning, texture, and quality. Uh, and there are an um, uh, incredible number of, of, of complex languages within this culture. And uh, at uh, during the Edo period, um, broadly uh, early 16 hundreds to mid 1800s, there arrived um, a bit of a shock to this uh, culture in the form of some tree edicts where some people were allowed to wear certain things, some people weren't allowed to wear certain things. And something emerged called, uh, known as iki. And this is actually something very hard to explain. Um, it's uh, basically a, a form of, of uh, chic sensibility. Um, and it's thought to have formed, um, emerged from the mercantile, the trade uh, classes in, in, in Edo, in old Tokyo, uh, and um, is about um, uh, bucking the system. And it's about, uh, broadly about, uh, in, in what I'm looking at, a subtlety, which uh, is in contradiction to what a lot of people assume of kimono culture, which is, is more gaudy um, a very obvious, uh, this is a Meisen kimono, early, early 20th century, and Iki is, is an opposite spectrum. And here's us uh, in the collections in, in um, Tokamachi, which is the main um, object here, Tokamachi Museum. Tokamachi means a 10th um, day town, and this town had its market, its cloth market, on the 10th day of the month. And a lot of Japanese uh, local cultures uh, were completely operated around textile culture. And this is Kogaya, which was a dealer in, in, um, in the um, uh, Chijimi uh, cloth that we're, we're going to see here. Um, and these were discovered in the archives of, of the uh, Kogaya um, trading house by the uh, local museum group, which um, have preserved uh, these things. So here's an example of Chijimi cloth. Um, it is the weft yarn in the cloth is, is over twisted, uh, which gives the fabric a very bouncy light quality. Um, and it makes it very comfortable and desirable as formal wear, which is very important in, in the Japanese summers. And uh, this object is, um, was uh, commissioned uh, by um, Tokugawa Nariyuki, who now the image you're seeing, which is an appalling image, I'm sorry for that, that's all I have to hand. This is actually the father of Tokugawa Nariyuki, but it gives you a feeling of the kind of uh, character we can imagine. He was a, a daimyo. Daimyo were uh, regional lords um, in, in the uh, system in Japan at the time. Uh, and um, he would have been charged with looking after district affairs um, out of his home uh, town and out of the capital. And he was based in, in Wakayama over, over here, which is about 650 kilometers from um, the Tokomachi area, which I've just shown, which is in Niigata, which is another uh, 250 or something from, from Tokyo. So you've got this extraordinary triangle of geography. Uh, and if bear in mind, this is a time, a long time before any kind of normal transport that we're used to now. So a lot was being engineered here. Um, as a daimyo, he would have been required to maintain a residence in the capital in, in Tokyo. And he won, uh, in this uh, role, one needed to demonstrate sophisticated cultural sensibility, especially concerning dress. And this is an example of, of, of menswear. Um, which again, I've jumped too far, which uh, the, it's highly coded, it's about gender, it's about class, occupation, it's about seasonality, and it's about what the Japanese call TPO, time, place, and occasion, what one wears, when and when doesn't. Um, so we are, we're talking about a very deliberate ordering and securement of uh, plain looking textiles, which indicate um, uh, his uh, sartorial values in, in defining himself in the culture he was living in. Um, and it also demonstrates level of cultural infrastructure in, in place at the time. 
So a dying north in the west of Japan, ordering significant volumes of Echigo cloth from the northeast coast for use as a society wardrobe in eastern metropolitan capital, where it carries significant cultural currency. So these are the textile objects. I'm going to go a little bit faster. When we opened the box that you might remember was on the table, we, there are a set of these Tatoshi um, um, paper wrappers. And uh, in the small set, here we are. So this is the Goyo Chijimi Hinegata, which literally means high grade Chijimi pattern book. So it's, it's um, laid, and this is what it says uh, on the stamps. It's actually uh, completely framed in every way as a high grade uh, material. So we open these envelopes and we find these mounted annotated cuttings and we start to zoom in. And each, uh, each uh, piece of cloth has um, specific details for its reproduction. So um, the uh, different differentiation uh, is purely through a number of pattern and ground uh, warps and wefts. It includes um, hairline stripes, uh, double line stripes and checks. And while these latter uh, mixes, uh, mixed stripes are regular, there are irregular shad shadow effects. So here we have um, a warp uh, stripe. You can see through the linen tester here, the fine scale. These are 40 uh, warp ends and picks per centimeter. Anyone that's ever handled hand spliced rami knows how incredibly fine that is. This is extremely sophisticated craftsmanship. All in plain weave. Uh, top left for the, the non-weavers, but I think there's lots of great expert weavers in, in the group here. Um, they're very, very rare, very any exceptions, and these are all plain weave cloths. Um, so the stripes consist of two or more war pens. Um, uh, here we've got uh, two and eight, that's very common, my analysis. Uh, here's an example of a check. Less uh, numerous than the stripes. The check range is more limited and consists of even numbers of two or more ends and picks. Lattices are common and is one elongated design you see here, uh, which appears a few times suggesting a fashionable um, popularity. And I've observed it in other collections too. Here, a fine uh, triple lined lattice check formed of regular two and two stripe and six ground ends. This is very geeky, I apologize for this, but this is, this is my weaver's eye. And this gives the effect of receding um, ground squares. Uh, and then again, when we do this horizontal analysis, we start to see the, um, this uh, full uh, picture. Um, so the patterning includes these single and double hairline stripes, wide and narrow stripes, elongated lattices, single, double and triple lattice checks, and hairline checks. Um, the woven checks and stripes in this Hinagata are very simple and um, ordered in their design content. They reflect both the limited technical scope and materiality and the exquisite degrees of sophisticated handmaking in the vernacular. Um, the range of designs is extremely subtle and together with the specific annotations emphasizes that color, yarn, count and quality and woven density are of equal importance as the pattern. Significantly, the collection demonstrates the capacity to create almost infinite subtle variation in pattern design with only uh, limited content. There are some ECATs in the collection, um, which uh, also are supported with these um, uh, technical um, specifications, uh, but they, they're outside my uh, frame of, of key interest. So I, I haven't uh, spent a lot of time with them. Uh, so um, just to, just to uh, end on the, the fact that there's within this limited um, range, the, um, there's an extraordinary amount of information, uh, which I believe is is commonly forgotten when you when we move beyond this uh, time period, when this complexity of uh, possibility uh, arrives and hybridity, etc., that comes later with uh, textile uh, culture. So it's wonderful uh, that something like this can remind us of um, the 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 range and potential within a limited vocabulary, and that um, it's it's an example of how. Uh, something really quite subtle actually tells us an awful lot uh, about material culture and society um, at the time. This work is due to be published as part of uh, a paper for the Journal of Textile Design Practice and Research, um, which has been on hold for a number of reasons, but hopefully you might see it sometime soon. And I think that's my 20 minutes. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, are there any questions or comments? Um, YouTube, we have a small lag. I just wanted to say I really loved seeing your sample books. <laughs> I mean, I always thought that they were beautiful. I've seen 18th century sample books from the uh, from the Portuguese manufacturer of wool, and they're just they're so beautiful. <laughs> also, I just wanted to comment one of the first Ishigo Jofu that you've shown. They were so thin that they almost <laughs> looked like drawings on top of paper. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, they're they, like so small. Yeah, they're 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 very thin. They're they're almost glassy, um, and you um, there's a little bit of, it's a little bit ironic because the uh, Japanese wardrobe is is uh, one of the elements is um, uh, it's about, it's about often about display that those kind of things, but it's also about concealment. Uh, mm -hmm. The Japanese are modest, and so these uh, transparent cloths seem a little bit. Um, Oppositional to to the to uh, not revealing oneself, <laughs> but um, they were worn in layers, um, and of course the, the kimono also wraps around itself. So, um, but they're very very crisp and and very light, um, and incredibly fine. It's um, I've I've done uh, field research on the uh, fiber, uh, the, the the growing, the raising, the conversion of fiber in Fukushima as well so uh, having done that it gives you an extra sense of just how uh, sophisticated these cloths are uh, and then on, on top of the, the the crafting comes this this design uh, aspect uh, and then the cultural context so it's really quite extraordinary when you think of this uh, the, 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 the triangle of course cloth trade is uh, famously uh, much much wider than, than a national uh, geography uh, but but that one person's um, um, sense of themselves can command such a strong triangle of production was <laughs> is amazing. Yeah, when I when I saw that, I at first I looked like really closely because it, I was like, those are drawings, those are not. And then then I noticed that they were very 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 fine textiles, but they would wear it in layers and in. They were they had different patterns in each layer, or they would have the same pattern. They would no. Um, what I what I haven't shown you, I haven't um, spent time here on on how kimono is constructed of its different elements. But uh, there are uh, different sort of treatments to to the main kimono outfit. So um, uh, with the kimono, the main kimono itself contains one uh, design, if you like. And then the other elements, the obi, et cetera, that come with it will, will bring some kind of contrast or complement. Um, but this is a very restrained um, aesthetic. Again, it's a hangover from this uh, Edo um, development. And, and it's actually something that lasts. And, and iki, I mentioned, is, is uh, people talk about iki gaaru, which means uh, it, it carries iki. It has this sort of quality to it. It's something that is preserved in the Japanese aesthetic. Thank you, Magda. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry because I'm completely like my knowledge about that part of the world and textiles is very very limited. And I was wondering uh, because yes, in my imagination, I suppose like in many people's like when you say kimono, I see there's those like yeah, very beautiful pieces you shown. And so uh, this uh, stripe pattern is something uh, which is like you can trace it uh in the longer time it has always existed but it's just we are not aware of or i i'm, I'm just wondering if somehow there were some kind of patterns which might have been for example uh i don't know forbidden or or, or marked by us like bad symbolism negative uh things and people were not wearing it I, I was thinking like for example in medieval europe i think stripes uh striped textiles somehow were also Related to devil and things like that. Yes. So, yeah. Yes, there are there are all there are all sorts of um, aspects around uh, stripes and checks, um, and and I I don't have the time. You know, it's a it's a bigger conversation, a much bigger conversation. Uh, but uh, the our reason for focusing on stripes and checks again is the fact that um, there's a massive 
um, range of, of striped and check patterning vocabularies when you go to that pre-jacquard development. And in almost every textile culture of the world, really, you'll find, find it in some form because uh, cloth patterning uh, using warp and weft uh, changes is the simplest way to pattern a surface. And so that was, my research has shown quite quickly that, you know, that that was the how most things were, were patterned until a point in time when the possibilities just exploded. And then these this um, relatively simple uh, vocabulary, um, in, in, in it never went away, but it sort of got lost in the mix of all the many, many, many possibilities that arrived. So we... We have stripes and checks, of course, but they're they're part of something a much much bigger mix now. Whereas when you're looking at this period, we could be looking at any uh, culture from the world. We see this extraordinary range with a, this essentially limited vocabulary, and that's what's so fascinating. And so, I hope you agree these things are incredibly timeless. One of the reasons we started the research is there there's something here that it can go down a catwalk. Uh, tomorrow and be absolutely knockout. It, it, it's um, time proof, <laughs> this kind of simplicity. And that's what uh, we, we were hoping to um, celebrate through that uh, larger research project. Um, and it's been fascinating learning more by making this close analysis of these kind of objects, which really show the range that's, that's possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if there are no more questions. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Oh, yeah. So I just want to say there's a comment from the YouTube channel uh, from Penelope Laliotti, who uh, thinks it was a great presentation. So I think you should just hear that. Thank you very and, much. And I agree. I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. So now let's move on to our next uh, presenter, Alexandra Kolakovic. Um, is an historian, historian and senior research associate at the Institute for Political Sciences in uh, Belgrade. Is she here? I don't, I was about to say, I don't see her yet on Zoom. I tried to contact her. Uh, I checked the email uh, at during lunch break and I had no information about the cancellation, but I just tried to uh, contact her. Well, maybe we can move on to Carolina Kupa if that's okay. And then I hope, yeah, yeah, it would be possible. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Okay, great. So Carolina Anna Kulpa is a cultural expert and historian researcher of the reception of antiquity. Her research interests comprise the reception of images of ancient historical figures in pop culture, especially Cleopatra VII, including reception of antiquity in children's and in young adults' culture, particularly toys, and modern manifestations of Egyptomania. She graduated Adam Mikiewicz University in Poznan. I'm sorry. <laughs> In 2017-2018, she worked at the Faculty of Art Artes Liberales, University of Warsaw, in the project Our Mythical Childhood ERC Consolidator Grant as a postdoctoral researcher. Go ahead, Carolina. Yeah, thank you very much for that nice introducing. Uh, and uh, I would like to share my screen. I hope that it will be okay. Could you see my presentation? Yes, you just need to put it on present on. Uh... This is the present. Yeah, right. Okay, so yeah, so good job for me. <laughs> uh, and I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to give a presentation on Cleopatra Seven because this figure of Egyptian queen fascinated me for many years. If I could ask you uh, to imagine or recall from memory the image of this historical figure, what would you? What uh, what would, would she look like? Would she have a particular hairstyle, eye color, or perhaps makeup? Would she wear an ancient Egyptian dress or perhaps a contemporary outfit as we see on famous designers show? Going further, when you think about Cleopatra, do you imagine a particular theme or the face of the actors who played the queen? Our perception of Cleopatra is dependent on many factors, above all the culture in which we live, 
Sorry, this is an airplane. <laughs> Influenced by the rapid flow or information, but, but also by the. Sorry for that. Yes. <laughs> Above all, by the culture in which we live, influenced by the rapid flow or information, but also by the global popularity. <laughs> Yeah, I hope that they just go. By the culture that we live, influenced by the rapid flow of information, but also by the global popularity of many works of pop culture. The main aim of my research about Cleopatra's figure is to undertake an academic approach towards cinematography and also usually underestimated forms of human activity and items associated with them, such as toys, which, however, appear to be a career of content important for a better understanding of contemporary culture. I believe that the classical reception studies allow us to understand the certain process running into contemporary culture in which antiquity becomes a significant component of or even the basis of the media culture universe. I am still looking for a methodology to achieve my goal and try to adopt certain concepts from classical reception studies cultural studies, visual culture studies, material culture studies, and sociology as usual tools. I would like to present one aspect of my research, an analysis of the clause in which the Egyptian rural is depicted, and which, in my opinion, determine how we shape the image of our Cleopatra, the Egyptian pop queen, a hybrid of a historical figure and a pop culture image saturated with complex symbolism based on representations in literature, art, film, etc. In each decade of the 20th and 21st centuries, the creators present their versions of Cleopatra's image, which, like a mirror, reflect the beauty and fashion canons on the time. Pop culture has reduced features of Cleopatra's image to easily identifiable, stereotypical character in oriental outfits, which have quasi-Egyptian elements and or record the book of the day of Thousand Nights and by dancers' costumes. I believe that simplified and stereotypical image allows recipients to identify the representations of the queen without a doubt. It should be noted that I understand the term oriental according to Edward Said's concept of orientalism as an interest in a, in a particular area of the world, in analyzed case, the ancient Egypt, from a European point of view, with a large dose of stereotypes mixed with only basic knowledge of this culture. Cleopatra Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt of the Ptolemaic dynasty, appears to be one of the better known figures of the ancient world, while certain events of her life have become firmly established in the broadly understood European culture in the form of imagery, novels, dramatic plays, films, etc. Over almost 2000 years, the myth of the Lazural on the Egyptian throne as a femme fatale of antiquity was created. And on this slide, I would like to very quickly show you the, the reception of Cleopatra's image. Of course, it's a huge topic because it's 2000 years of, of reception of the images, plays and films. But I think that the creators uh, showed only a few elements of her life like that uh, she was the solo, solo ruler of the Egypt, but in fact, she was a historical figure, only a queen, not a pharaoh. As you can see, she was very often depicted as a very beautiful woman. Of course, they uh, emphasized the relationships with Roman, Romans, uh, with Caesar and with Mark Antony, as you can see on the picture. And she was presented, uh, as you can see, as the queen of the, from the East, which was emphasized by, for example, the skins of white cats. And her court was also depicted as very luxurious and Alexandria as the court uh, that they just make, have fun, a lot of banquets and entertainment. 
but she was also depicted as very, um, very, I think, ruthless ruler, testing poisons, for example, and just don't care about people. And of course, she was the enemy of Aram and she was defeated. So this is, the, this is also a very important aspect of her life in reception. And she, she died, of course, very, uh, by suicide using uh, vipers or uh, other sorts of snake. But in fact, we don't know how she, how she died because the circumstances in antiquity were no, not known. And in my opinion, but there's also a huge topic, um, Shakespeare and Cleopatra on stage. I mean, theater, theater also, opera and ballet. They, this is a huge part of reception of Cleopatra. And um, I think this playwright just create our, recep our per perception of Cleopatra's image. Yeah, but it's the, the other topic. So I just show you that. I think that's Shakespeare, very, very important part of Cleopatra's image. And the first, I uh, I think that I show you the, <laughs> a little bit about the reception of Cleopatra and that the rural fascinated successive generation of artists who tried to answer the basic question, what was she really like? I am not a textile specialist, nor do I have a background in fashion. As a cultural studies scholar and historian, I will present in my opinion, the most representative examples of material and audiovisual culture created during the last 100 years and highlight how the creators used the costumes, also the accessories to construct an identity of queen as a contemporary oriental beauty. The first examples are representations of Cleopatra in future films from 1917 to 2002. From more than 200 films, according to EIMBD, its internet media database, I would like to present the performances of actresses, Hilda Barra, Claudette Colbert, Elizabeth Taylor, and Monica Bellucci. A historical figure was used to create a very beautiful and voluptuous queen from the East. In most of the record examples of cinematic incarnations of Cleopatra, she does not appear as the mother of Caesarion, Julius Caesar's son, the exception being the film with Taylor, as well as the children from her relationship with Mark Antony. The plot is centered on the story of a dangerous temptress who brings destruction to the men who love her or stand in her way to power. Unfortunately, the 1970 film with Ted Abara has not survived except for a fragment that lasts about several seconds, maybe seven, uh, maybe a, a few dozen seconds. From the surviving stills of the film, an image of Ptolemaic Queen as a tempting bump is emerging. Especially noteworthy is a very bold gold bra in the shape of snakes and the transparent robe slit at the side up to the waist showing naked legs. I will return to this costume in a moment. Claudette Colbert costumes in the 90s 34 production directed by Ceci Demille are also delightful. The outfits designed by Travis Banton and Vicky Williams were sold from materials that were fashionable in the 1920s and 1930s. That is lame, chiffon, crepe, and silk. Especially notable is the pleated green dress worn by Colbert Cleopatra. Sorry for that. <laughs> During Caesar's farewell on Ides of March, you can see this dress on a screen. Please notice the quasi Egyptian elements. And you can see uh, that a version of dress from 1930s that is, I think, very similar to, to this one worn by uh, Colbert. The other example is a shimmering gown with a long orange cape, cape worn by the queen waiting for her wedding to Julius on the same day. <laughs> On 
also interesting is the pearl lined white dress shown in the scene of the meeting with Antony on the boat in Tarsus. And the rope worn in the scene of Tezik poison, poisons of prisoners. Please uh, notice the um, birdish, I think, accents on the breast. So covering the breast, it was quite, I think, brave in 1930s to show this kind of dress in cinema. The clothes are also, all of them are very brave, always with a decollete and sometimes barely covering the actress's breast. For example, the outfit while doing the first meeting with Julius Caesar when the ruler appears from an unrolled carpet. Cleopatra's dress is a necktie bra barely covering her breast and a long skirt with two slides up to her hips. It is made of a shiny material decorated with a belt and a necklace with cloth attached to it. Another interesting dress is the one shown during her conversation with Mark Antony after Rome has declared war. The actress also wears an outfit very similar to the one captured in the photo with Kedabara, a gold spalling bra and a transparent skirt. Almost of all of Cleopatra, Claudette, I'm sorry, almost of all of Claudette Colbert's creations are embroidered with gold thread, glittering and shimmery. Colbert's image as Cleopatra is complemented by headwear in the form of so-called vulture's crown, and a Sandy's crown or during Caesar's triumph in Rome, also various types of gold diadems decorated with jewels and feathers, and wig shaped aircars, as you can see on the screen. Joseph Mankiewicz's 1963 film, on the other hand, is to date the most spectacular production devoted to the last Ptolemaic ruler on the Egyptian throne. The member of employed extra, the elaborate sets of the Rome and Alexandria, the actor's rates with the enormous amount of $1 million for Elizabeth Taylor, even today, after more than half a century, placed Cleopatra in the list of the most expensive production in the history of cinema, which almost brought the Fox studio to ruin. Elizabeth Taylor's closing is a rather free interpretation of those worn in antiquity. John Salomon claims that more uh, claims that more than $130,000 was spent on the all of actresses' outfits, including wigs and jewelry. Irene Sharaf, the costume designer, according to Lord Font, chose not to use a depiction of ancient Egyptian log white linen dress, color series, because of this textile tendency to wrinkle and being too monotonous for the audience to see. Instead, she chose to use colorful silks or silk-like synthetics and to make all of the jewelry in gold. Without a doubt, some of her designs are modern, probably to emphasize the voluptuous figure of Elizabeth Taylor. The actress presents herself in each scene in George's gowns, 41 in total, only twice appearing in the same outfit. These outfits made, among other things, of silk in almost every color of the rainbow as well as silver, gold, white, black, and brown, were so to emphasize with the corset wore underneath the actress's hourglass-shaped figure and her breast, noticeable thanks to the deep-cut necklines. The gold costume in the scene of the entry into Rome, costing, uh, according to Salomon, about $6,500, consists of a high-neck dress and a cape made to look like wings. Wrapping around Taylor's figure, perhaps intended to portray the queen as the goddess Isis. The corset of the dress was decorated with a pattern resembling feathers, and the image of Cleopatra as the goddess was completed with a huge crown made of so-called vulture's crown with an uraus and a sun disc between two horns. The same outfit is seen, in the, is seen in the death scene of the Egyptian ruler and has been immortalized as a Barbie doll depicting Taylor as the Egyptian ruler. The Monica Bellucci's outfit in the 2002 production Asterix and Obelix Mission Cleopatra, directed by Alan Chabat, were designed by Philippe Dilotel, Canino Liberatore, and Florence Sadon, creating dresses on the one hand resembling those we know from costume balls, and on the other referring to the designs of recognized fashion houses. The designers can impress with their craftsmanship, and without a doubt, the outfits emphasize as always, the actress's 
Swiss chant, such as the black transparent gown with a corset decorated with pearl seen in the final scene. Bellucci's other clothes are also interesting, as we can see on the screen. One of them directly refers to the queen's attribute, no prom paintings depicting her death, the snake. We see a greenish pleated and snake embroidered dress with two heads of snakes covering her breast, and the image is complemented by a diadem with snake-like reptiles and golden ornaments in the shape supporting the actress's high hair. In another outfit, using the scene of the conversation with Julius Caesar, references to the creation of Kedabara can be noticed as the costume consists of a gold bra and a slim drapet skirt with a belt. An interesting element of Bellucci's Cleopatra image are the headpieces, often a modern interpretation of those worn by the rulers of ancient Egypt. In the scene of showing the palace to the Romans, a sculptural headdress, a sort of fancy head can be seen, which can be interpreted as a modern version of the so-called vulture's crown. The next and final group of case studies are representations of Cleopatra in animations and thought. Cleo the nice character from Monster High is a matter creation that was released in 2010. The franchise includes web series, feature films, and a series of those with accessories. The image of Cleo refers directly to the cinematic representations of Cleopatra. It is a hybrid of the character captured representation of the queen in Mankiewicz's film and the depiction of the magnificent mummy of the Egyptian princess. In all Cleo's clothes seen in the series and in the doll models, the pattern of magic bandages is dominant and among, among the other colors, gold and turquoise. The biography of the Nile contains an interesting information. She always has to wear a piece of enchanted bandage, otherwise she would turn into dust. You can see examples of Cleo clothes on the scene, on the screen. Probably many of them uh, could be worn by our contemporary film stars or celebrities. In its basic version, the outfit is a kind of bandage jumpsuit, uh, jumpsuit with an additional piece of cloth on the right arm, gold, gold jewelry in the form of a diadem in the hair, earrings, bracelet, sandals, and a decorative belt. The outfit is also accessorized with a turquoise grab or jandy top with black lining, a matching gold and black handbag, and a mobile phone in a case attached to her tie. The last example is the 2010 Barbie doll for adult recipients, also from Mattel. The doll is presented in a green and black skirt with a slit to the hip and in a huge golden turquoise headdress decorated with a scarab and a snake with two wing-like elements covering her naked breast. The outfit is complemented by an orange and white cape, gold sandals, earrings, and a log scepter resembling a staff, topped with a figure similar to the representation of the goddess Isis. The provocative clothes of the, of the black haired doll in combination with the characteristic makeup, possibly inspired by Monica Bellucci's role as Cleopatra, is, in my opinion, another depiction of the Ptolemaic queen as an ancient femme fatale. In my presentation, I have shared with you my short analysis of exemplifications of Cleopatra's outfits in audiovisual and material culture from the 20th and 21st centuries. We, as creators and recipients, shape what our Cleopatra is like and what makes her image continuously present in culture for 2,000 years. It is the elaborately decorated costume that are one of the elements that dominate our perception of this queen. In my opinion, this Egyptian pop queen is now the oriental beauty with beautiful face and body in quasi Egyptian oriental clothes adapted to the fashion of the decade in which a particular costume designer created. And now, when you think of Cleopatra, how would she look like? Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina. <laughs> I really liked your presentation. And I think that some of these uh, dresses from the first movies, especially, they are probably now museum objects. 
<laughs> I think so. Yeah, um, sorry for the appearance. My my window is closed, but yeah, it's just sorry. Oh, don't worry about it. We heard you perfectly. Um, yeah, Roxana. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for a very, very rich presentation. And by the way, uh, Cleo, uh, Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra rules. I mean, I think she's like the epitome for like everything. Uh, I was wondering if uh, there's another uh, Egyptian queen that has been constructed uh, in this kind of uh, beauty ideal, not to the extent of Cleopatra, of course, but uh, do you believe that uh, between, I don't know, Nefertiti and Cleopatra, is there a connection? Uh, yes, I think it's quite a difficult question uh, because Nefertiti... Oh, Kathleen, I think you are frozen. Uh, um, I am going to shut down your video, so maybe this will improve your, your sound. Carolina, are you oh, there? Okay. Can you hear us? I'm back, sorry for that, yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that, yes, everything go wrong, yeah, during my presentation, <laughs> so Marty is low. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what do you hear. What do you hear from my uh, response? But I think that uh, Nefertiti is a quite new um, queen for for our culture because he she was. I think um, uh, the bust was found in the beginning of 20th century, and she will. She weren't. She weren't now in 2000 years like Cleopatra. But I think that it's a good. I think figure to create a new narrative about ancient Egypt. And I think there's a lot of representations in culture during the last 100 years of Nefertiti. And when you just, I think, um, Google, for example, uh, jewelry with Cleopatra, very often there's a bust of Nefertiti just <laughs> named Cleopatra. And so, yeah, so I think the the, um, the creators sometimes mix the two in one per, in one per, um, Magda? Uh, yeah, just in addition, it, it's certainly evident what I will say, but it's, uh, I think, mostly related to the fact that Cleopatra, like, directly interacted with the Mediterranean world and Roman sources. We basically, I think we perceive her through the description we had, uh, like, you know, and the biographies we have from the Roman world, and we do not have access uh, so much to the Egyptian sources, which, where she was perceived in a completely another manner. And so I think Nefertiti has not interacted yet enough with our culture. So I think perhaps her narrative will, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will come, but it will be more grounded on Egyptian sources. So the way we will perceive her should be completely different, I think. We'll see in the future. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, because uh, one thing about Nefertiti is the, the presence of the portrait from Amarna with, uh, together with uh, Eknaton. And there was a question, with, which is the actual depiction, the real depiction of Nefertiti, the Amarna or the bust? That's true, but we don't have uh, uh, the, the ancient literary sources. So we don't have a story of uh, Nefertiti and we have a lot of story about Cleopatra. Maybe not true, but <laughs> yeah, but there's this a story and a biography. Cecily? 
Oh, yes, thank you for your presentation. I absolutely loved it. It's fantastic. Some of those costumes are amazing and insane at the same time. I have a, like a more, um, I don't know, practical question. Do you know, do these costumes still exist somewhere? Yeah, do you know where they are? I guess I'm not in the same place, but maybe, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Claudette Colbert's uh, outfits, um, if you can, maybe you can remember the colorful pictures that yes. are the existing. I, mm -hmm. I'm sure that they exist. Uh, they are, for example, in auction houses. You can just buy, buy oh. them. <laughs> yeah, wow. I think Debbie Reynolds created a Hollywood Museum of Costume, I think, but, uh, but the, then they just sell it. Um, so maybe they're in the world just in the museums on in private hands and Elizabeth Taylor's costumes are also after her death were sad. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure that maybe they are on the exhibitions somewhere, but yeah. I'm not but I'm not sure where yeah. and yeah. So it's not a one exhibition. So no no I thought maybe that would I don't know a movie company, a production company, I don't know, maybe that would be something because that would be an amazing special exhibition to do one day to on uh, some of these uh, Costumes. I think a private maybe fans of uh, Colbert or Taylor just bought it, and I'm not sure. But for, mm. I know the orange cape is also I think still available to buy. But okay. it's a pretty house, so I think it's quite yeah pricey. Yeah, it's probably not for my private budget. Although I would love to wear it coming <laughs> to work in my museum. I would get some attention. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kahalina. Um, I think there's a comment on YouTube from Penelope Laviotti saying very interesting information and nice approach. Yeah. So are there any more comments or questions? Well, since we're not seeing um, our previous speaker, Alexandra Kolakovic, I would say that maybe we can close off this session. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think I'm, I, I was in contact with her like if, uh, two days ago. I know she's in Paris and she has like, uh, she's also in another conference on this time, but she let me, I mean, I understood that she will be there and apparently, yeah, perhaps there has been a delay. I don't, I, I'm, I didn't receive any answer for now. So yeah, I think we can, perhaps yeah yeah that like, say the final words <laughs> yeah yes yeah well i think in yeah with paula and cecily we would like to thank you very very warmly and sincerely for your amazing papers which so so many many things inspiring presentations and new perspectives and and thank you also for your presence and the discussions we had uh, during these three days uh i think we all had a lot of uh, information and it is not our intention to go through each paper and make a resume but i think uh, what is really uh great i think the great outcome of this conference is to is that shown that i mean what was the purpose of euro app is really that that we all work on so many different areas and and periods but the common ground like clothing and identity is something we share and I think um, our idea was to, uh, because it's also a question we had, um, that uh, it would be super uh, if we can integrate uh, your work and this conference uh, in the EuroWeb anthology, uh, which uh, we, the, the main idea is to have co-authored papers on, on the themes related to EuroWeb project. And I think we had uh, several papers addressing the question of uh, women's headdresses. I think this, this, for example, could be a really nice uh, paper uh, to produce. We saw also uh, the, the various uh, levels of uh, cloth regulation and the legislations, how, how it is, uh, uh, how it was, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, how it was uh, apprehended for the elites, but also uh, we saw that it works in a, in another way for like the lower classes. I think we have here another very interesting subject. I mean, today we saw uh, so many papers dealing with uh, 
showing the, the various uh, trends such as Orientalism. Uh, we saw uh, also many presentations on folklore textiles. I think this is this is a subject which really deserves to be investigated. And I think like we all uh, all do our research in our small corner with specialists, but now it's how we really gain and enrich our knowledge by sharing it with uh, other uh, specialists. So, I mean, I will not uh, do a whole list of all the things we have addressed because there, there are very, really, really many. But uh, yes, this would be like our final words, like it's not the end, but just the beginning. And it would be super nice if we can all together uh, have uh, this, uh, this common outcome in the anthology. So we will uh, send us in the forthcoming days more details about uh, that, uh, that project because there is an ed editorial team uh, in Euroweb, uh, which manages like the, this general organization, and uh, we are also divided in uh, four working groups. So yeah, we'll give you more details for those who are not uh, yet, or who, who are not, who want to, I mean, you can participate even if you are not in Euroweb, but many of us are already. And if you wish to join us, you are very, very welcome. So yeah, I think that would be, yeah, that would be a final uh, word of that. Uh, of that conference. I don't know if uh, Cecilia or Paula wants to add anything. Yeah, please. <laughs> yes, well, it's just a minor thing. I just want to uh, give a reminder, uh, sorry to end on a boring note, and a reminder of our status meeting on Wednesday the 11th at 10 o'clock, uh, GMT plus two. I will send a reminder to you all again on Monday and everybody, of course, welcome. And here we will also discuss the publications in the anthology so if you have time to think about it and there will also be time to pose questions etc etc about the, these publications on Wednesday just yeah. yeah and just perhaps as a final final thank I really would like to thank Paula and Francisco for their like technical support we because with Cecily we are not super technical no, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much because otherwise it would have been really uh, bad. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much for your support uh, and managing all these, uh, yeah, 2.0 techniques. <laughs> mm -hmm. And thank you to all the participants because I, I know it's not the same interacting uh, through the screen and we didn't have the occasion to go for a cup of wine after the conference and to discuss deeper. But I mean, we hope that it was a way uh, to meet during these three days and to share common ideas and subjects. And I hope we can uh, work together uh, in the forthcoming months. Yeah. So thank you. We wish you a nice evening, wherever you are and a nice weekend. And you will hear from us very, very soon. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank and you. Thank you, uh, all the listeners on YouTube as well. Sorry, yes. but yeah. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Joanna. Bye. Okay. Okay. It went well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, wow. <laughs> wow. We, we are not online anymore. Deep sigh. Oh yeah. my god. Thank you, everybody. You did amazing, all of you. Yeah, great job. Thanks a lot. Oh wow. Jesus. We made it. <laughs> With almost all our speakers, I think we're quite lucky.